sleep, sleep on, forget thy pain. My hand is on thy brow, my spirit on thy brain. My pity on thy heart, poor friend. And from my fingers flow the powers of life. And like a sign, seal thee from thine hour of woe. And brood on thee, but may not blend. Sleep, sleep on. I love thee not, but when I think that he who made and makes my lot, as full of flowers as thine and weeds, might have been lost like thee, and that a hand which was not mine might then have charmed his agony, as I and others, my heart bleeds. Sleep, sleep, and with the slumber of the dead and the unborn, forget thy life, love. Forget that thou must wake forever. Forget the world's dull scorn. Forget lost health and the divine feelings which die in youth's grief. And forget me, for I can never be. Like a cloud, big with a May shower, my soul weeps healing rain with thee, thou withered flower. It breathes mute music on thy sleep, its odor calms thy brain. Its light within thy gloomy breast spreads like a second youth again. By mind thy being is to its deep possessed. The spell is done. How feel you now? Better. Quite well, replied the sleeper. What would do you good when suffering and awake? What cure your head and side? What it would cure that would kill me today? And as I must on earth abide a while, yet tempt me not. Hello everyone, this is indeed Chrononauts. We have not been hijacked by a New Age poetry podcast. This is Chrononauts, the science fiction literature history podcast. And as always, this is JM, and I'm here with Nate. How you doing today? All right, things are good. We're getting better. And we are doing a topic that turned out to be way more complex and have much more depth to it than I was expecting. Yeah, definitely a lot of volume of background and primary literature related to this one. Yeah, that's something that I wanted. I do want to comment on because there was, in fact, so much background reading that could have been done for this episode. And really, I think we're just scratching the surface of a yeah. lot of things. Yeah. And the interesting thing, I mean, it is an interesting thing, but it's also a factor of the way time has changed outlooks on things. But most people today 
do not really think of what we're going to talk about as an actual science. When this started out in the Western world in the late 1700s as a phenomenon that people recognized, in the beginning, it was also not really considered a scientific phenomenon. In fact, the person who is often characterized as the discoverer of this concept of animal magnetism, Anton Mesmer, Franz Anton Mesmer, is considered a bit of a charlatan and may indeed have been so. But again, we're walking on very shaky ground with talking about the background to this stuff because I know that I myself have never, not that I have walked in the right circles, you understand, but I have never really noted any truth to these kinds of phenomena. So I guess you can take that as a disclaimer, if you will. We're not going to just keep saying, oh, allegedly, allegedly, the way some people do about things they're not really sure about, or all, you hear it a lot of conspiracy podcasts and stuff like that. You know, you could take a drink every time someone says allegedly, and you would be pretty plastered by the end. So we don't really know about any of this. I'm going to start, though, with a very general attempt at discourse here. So the term mesmerism is not generally applied today unless people are writing pseudo-Victorian novels. Generally, it's simply referred to as hypnotism, and it is in some ways a more understood but less complex seeming topic than it was in the beginning. But I guess I'd like to start by asking, what is your personal experience with hypnotism? So I've always known it as like a party trick that people do at certain gatherings, you know, painful work events and things like that, where they'll get a hypnotist and somebody will pretend to act silly for a little while. And I never really gave it too much thought, but I found out about mesmer and animal magnetism a couple of years ago when doing research for some other stuff related to medical quackery devices from the 19th century, like electric belts and things like that, that would purport to cure pretty much everything under the sun. And a lot of those devices have their intellectual roots, you could say, in mesmerism, which was a really popular thing for quite some time. Like it just wasn't on the fringe of society where a couple charlatans and frauds were looking to promote this. A lot of people really believed in it. You know, high society, artistic people like Dickens and, as we'll see, Balzac were big proponents of it. British Prime Minister Arthur Balfour. Yeah, right, right. It's really everywhere. And it really has a long shelf life after Mesmer's death, who died in 1815. But it seems like it was really popular in the subsequent decades until the 1850s or so. And... While the term mesmerism isn't really used today in that context as frequently, there are still people out there who purport to be mesmeristic practitioners, and you can look up like practical mesmeric instructional videos on YouTube. Well, I think that part of the reason that the word fell out of favor, though, of course, is uh, Mesmer himself very much fell out of favor. Yeah, right. So people did not want to necessarily associate what they were doing with him, because even though he is considered the founder of the entire movement, so to speak. Almost every resource that I checked, the primary resources basically attested to his lack of credibility. Right. So, I mean, that's possibly telling, and, and it does seem like perhaps his experiments were more sensational than anything else, but we'll get to that. My personal experience, well, I mean, obviously I remember hearing about it from a young age, you see it a lot in movies where evil people with conniving intentions either hire or hypnotize themselves. Sometimes it's a damsel in distress. Sometimes it's an unwilling servant or something like that. And they get them to do things against their will, which, again, most practitioners seem to say is not something that you can do. Right. The modern day practitioners. But that was a big component of it during the 19th century, though, in a lot of these stories is manipulation of somebody else's willpower. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, and I even remember, obviously, there's certain characters, like one of the first examples that I could think of would be the master in Doctor Who, who liked to hypnotize their subjects. Right. And, of course, later on, I found out about Svengali, who's actually first invented in a book called Trilby. So the name of the movies and all that have come to be the name of the practitioner but yeah like i remember writing a story too because i thought it was really fascinating and you know i wrote the story and i think grade 
seven or eight or something about a a woman who was uh, married to this guy and he was this really rich guy and at first she thought she was going to be happy but he ended up being a controlling asshole and one of her friends from university hypnotized this guy and like messed up his life and made him kill himself <laughs> and it was a pretty morbid story yeah uh, for her. <laughs> but i think i think the big inspiration for that too is that i had read l ron hubbard's mission earth book mm. Uh, I think it was the first one, and in that book, the the protagonist is this really snivelly, villainous little guy, and he's like really unlikable. But he's the narrator of the story, and he's trying to make the goody two shoes like character that everybody's supposed to love, like the space hero guy. He's trying to make him look bad and trying to undermine his mission. But the guy's girlfriend ends up hypnotizing him and <laughs> pulling a number on him. And later on in the book, he finds out about that. So I kind of duplicated that scene because I thought it was so good. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ron Hubbard is an author we may come to later. I don't know how. I don't want to read Dianetics. Sorry. No. That's later down the road for sure. Yeah. I think he wrote some more reasonably long material. Uh, Yeah. I mean, I, I would do the first Mission Earth book because I think it's a fun kind of satirical mm -hmm thing but i never really got very far in the series i think i might have talked about that before but it, like it just gets really crappy once they go to earth so <laughs> yeah now the authors that we're going to be talking about today later on i will bring this up perhaps at the end again but since we're talking generalities right now i will say that it is difficult because of the tenuous nature of the subject and because of how we think about it today. It is difficult for a lot of people to see what we're going to talk about as science fiction. Yeah. But I do think it applies. No, absolutely. And the influence of it will certainly be felt later on in more explicitly science fiction works. Yeah, yeah definitely. I called up my buddy today because I remembered and I just wanted to get his thoughts on it. I remembered he'd gone to this hypnotist comedian. I don't know if you've heard of this guy. He's like, um, he goes around on tour and he does public shows. And I'm sure somebody will tell us or we can look it up on the internet after, but I, I hadn't had a chance to look it up and he couldn't remember the guy's name. But this guy basically goes around in front of audiences and like hypnotizes members of the audience and gets them to do things. Right. And apparently right. it's really, really hilarious. Yeah. I asked him if he thought there were plants in the audience and he said it, he wasn't sure, but it was probably a combination of that and people just being like, why would I walk away from this guy and like, why would I ruin the night for everybody? Like, yeah, nobody right. actually wants to see that. Like, right, everybody exactly. wants to have a good time. Yeah. So he might even say that, like he said, you know, he said to somebody, well, you, if you're not suggestible enough, like, that's fine. Just play along, right? Nobody will know the difference anyway. <laughs> and indeed, when even though there's a ton of documentation, because especially after the phenomenon of mesmerism took off in England, it seemed like there was a genuine effort to try and calm things down and to document everything and to try and approach this in a scientific way. Right. Which wasn't necessarily the case in the beginning. But you will see that there's still some questioning, at least on my part, and I'm sure on the part of many others nowadays. But how much of what you're seeing as documentation, again, is really just people going along with it and trying to make sense of it and also trying to make it seem like a cohesive and real thing yeah i just don't know again it's mostly from the point of view of the operators the mesmeric operators and some of them are physicians in fact many of them seem to be practicing physicians of the time and we don't know i mean at least i don't know necessarily if the events they describe really did happen that way yeah and some of them we looked at a few books and we'll we'll put them in the notes for this the episode but there were a few books that I looked through anyway for, for a lot of this. And I didn't really get too far in most of them because a lot of them are very big and yeah, <laughs> very they're long and they can go to... More or less practical guides on how to mesmerize somebody and the different effects and benefits and things you can do with the animal magnetism. But a lot of it just seems to me like pseudoscientific nonsense yeah. that it getting through like 600 pages of it it's a lot yeah <laughs> yeah um, and, and i did get a sense of difference in a lot of the texts like some of them seemed more willing to accept and believe all this stuff push it forward with the maximal degree of conviction whereas right. others seemed more skeptical and a little bit more like removed from the subject matter 
So, I mean, obviously at the time there was a great amount of divergence of opinion, and that of course makes sense for something like this. And I want to read some quotes in a moment from the Scientific Commission of the Royal Society in France, which examined the 27 propositions of Anton Mesmer, which essentially attempted to elucidate what his new science of animal magnetism is. Now when we say animal magnetism, I don't know when I first came into the to knowledge of that phrase, but it might very well have been the Scorpions 1980 album. Yeah. <laughs> now when they said animal magnetism, I don't know the lyrics of that song, but I think it's uh, like sexual. Right? Yeah, the cover makes very sense. much is too. Yeah. So I thought, I think at first when they said that, they were just like, oh, the beast and the the power of the beast being able to draw his prey. And I thought right. that was kind of the metaphor they were making. But, yeah. And they may have been, but the actual phrase in the context of what Mesmer and many other purveyors later meant was animal in context of the animating force of nature. So it refers not only to animals, it could refer to plants, it could refer to water. It's essentially a binding force uh, that generates life. It's been described as a liquid that is somehow invisible. Now, I don't pretend to really understand that, but I guess what they really mean is that it's like a liquid and that its properties manifest the way a liquid would. Yeah, right. Now, when Franz Anton Mesmer, who was a uh, citizen of Vienna, started practicing his art, he wasn't very well received in his native country, although I think at one point they did try to get him back, maybe once the, the phenomenon was a little bit more accepted. Mm. But he ended up going to France and spent time in Paris where he actually seemed to do a lot better. And his sessions were very much in vogue. And there are some unfortunate connotations that sometimes were brought up later, but uh, like it seems to be, you know, uh, various statements like, for example, women are much, much more susceptible to mesmerism than men are. And uh, this is something that is mentioned in many of the primary sources. And unfortunately, it's used in a lot of instances of the, uh, the opponents of mesmerism in particular. It's used as justification for the moral culpitude of mesmerists. And so essentially, this means that because in a lot of the initial experiments, there was a lot of full body contact, and this was generally men standing over women or, or well being over them and kind of like touching them in various ways in various places and of course there were a lot of doubts about that as maybe there should have been yeah, right but and a lot of it didn't you know took the form of this is a moral danger i was actually surprised although it may come up later and i haven't just haven't seen it yet but i was surprised but maybe not surprised because, I mean, we were in the Enlightenment by now and stuff, but uh, there was no, not a lot of mention of things you might expect, like demonic possession and stuff like that. Um, maybe some people thought that, and there certainly seems to have been some opposition among the Catholic Church. Yeah. But uh, a lot of it seems mostly on moral grounds. Once Mesmer made his practice in France, it seemed that everyone or all the world wished to be magnetized. Now, in the beginning, those magnetized or placed under the mesmeric influence, they are said to have displayed some pretty crazy symptoms. Now, uh, in terms of the way they felt, well, there could be localized heat or there could be various tingling sensations. Sometimes they were said to exhibit convulsions and they will have something that became referred to as a metacrisis, which involves convulsing. And by the way, usually this was done under Mesmer, and this was done in large groups of people. So it's not like what you think of today, where you would have the, the person in a room in, in, in private surroundings and, and being hypnotized by their, their operator. It was more of a public spectacle. So almost more of what I described happening with my friend, but it was supposedly not intended for a comedic effect. It was supposed to be restorative 
it was supposed to be therapeutic. And given the documentation and given how well people responded to it, even though the, <laughs> the exhibitions involved were sometimes alarming, at least the people involved seemed to believe that something good was happening. Yeah, the placebo effect can really go a long way. Oh, for sure. Yeah. They would wander around in the room and generally either try to relate to one another or repel one another. And it was like the way it's described, even though it's not mentioned in any of the sources that I could see, but it's it's kind of like being, it's it sounds like being really high. <laughs> it's It's not so much the calm, low-key state of hypnosis that is mostly what's described today and which came about later again i think yeah. largely under the english influence in many cases such as described by the commission of the royal society there are reports of the mesmerized women in particular becoming drawn to and infatuated by the operator and supposedly this is something that mesmer himself took advantage of and it's one of the things that is supposedly responsible for his falling from favor i think right, right now another thing though that the commission stated because they didn't actually believe that there was any great power here they didn't believe in the magnetic liquid and they thought that that he was basically taking advantage of their imaginations and their imitative their tendency towards imitative behavior it's interesting reading this because it seems in some ways slightly modern in terms of the way they were dismissing sort of hokey woo-woo kind of phenomena yeah absolutely but it's also very antiquated in its thinking about certain right. things like that women are are naturally of a much more nervous disposition than men are and that they have there was a theory going at the time that and it has to do with this term hysteria. But even despite the, the root of the word hysteria, it can also refer to men. And even back then, it sometimes referred to men. But what it actually has to do with is a phenomenon of the nervous system, which is connected with various nerve points actually being mobile in the body. So they move around at different times in different places. So when a person becomes agitated, it's as if they're nerve endings are becoming moving throughout their body and for example when people describe some of the mesmeric states somebody in a deep mesmeric trance sometimes speaking to them normally doesn't actually work because they're in such a trance that their auditory nerves have been translocated to a different part of their body so you might have to for example speak to their fingertips yeah, in order right. for them to hear what you're saying this was something that was common in women because it's just their, their disposition, right? Supposedly. And another thing too, there was a racial hierarchy of those who could be mesmerized. So at the top of the hierarchy, that is those most susceptible are Orientals and Eastern races. Below that, you have the Latin races being French and Spaniards and Italians and so forth. Below that, you have Englishmen and below that, Celts and Scots and so forth, and the Nordic races. So I guess this is sort of connected with ideas about Stoicism and the disposition of various cultural national characters, which again, we're getting into territory that seems very dubious, Yeah, but it's quite interesting. It's just it's, it, because it does reflect a lot of the thinking of the time. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. There were two documents that the Commission of the Royal Society, which was composed of a number of distinguished French scientists, as well as Benjamin Franklin, oddly enough. He was actually the ambassador to France from the United States at that time. And I guess being a prestigious scientist in his own right, it made sense to have him on the committee. Oh, absolutely. But the second document they submitted, which was the first one was widely available and easily read by anyone who could, I suppose. The second one was a secret document, and it was centered around this morality debate. They said that there could be worrying results caused by the imitation effect that mesmerism can convey. A funny story, we were looking up stuff online for this project, and one of the books I came across was called The Power of Mesmerism, and not really thinking too much of it. I'm just like, well, this might be useful. It looks like it's from the 1800s. I grabbed it off the internet, and it turns out to be a very wild erotic novel. Yeah. 
way more vulgar and foul in the language than I was expecting from something of that time, which yeah. was in the 1880s or 1890s. But I did a uh, word search, and the F word is used 33 times. The C word is used 81 times. Whew, and yeah. the G word, which is an antiquated word not used anymore, is used 14 times. So oh, it's a rather foul novel. <laughs> yeah, I didn't do a word search, which I should have thought of because I do that sometimes, but I did notice the word prick used many, many times. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah that, that's one of the tamer things of that, that novel. It's really quite gross in its subject matter. Yeah, but I guess it's something that obviously was done to titillate some people, and it's not as if we don't have that kind of thing nowadays, but the point being that I think that certain people foresaw perhaps the dangers inherent in mesmerism yeah. as it was described at the time. They said, this is a quote, it has been observed that women are like musical strings stretched in perfect unison. One is moved, all the others are instantly affected. The way they describe mesmerism is it's definitely something very physical. Later on, again, I'm gonna, I think this is a theme, but once the British really got a hold of it, it became a lot less touchy-feely. There was usually just passes done over the body and maybe light contact with the hands or something mm -hmm. but this almost the way this described there's there's actual full body contact yeah and some of the practical guides discuss which part of the body to press on if you want this effect or the nature of chakras or certain elements of different sections and spheres of the body and what type of energy they're connected to and that right. kind of thing. And that ties into the whole idea of when they say that Eastern peoples are most susceptible than anybody else. The notion, even though Mesmer is said to have discovered it, uh, it, it does predate him to a certain extent, at least the idea of animal magnetism. And in, in the 1800s, it was popular to link it to the mysteries of Isis Yeah, and the whole idea of the chakras and stuff like that ties yeah. into a lot of mysticism that's now become incorporated into uh, Western New Age thought right. and stuff. Yeah, the Binet and Fair book says that its origin dates back to the mid-16th century, so quite some time before Mesmer itself. That book, though, it's kind of hard to take anything it says like completely seriously. That's one of those texts that I think should be taken with a grain of salt. I thought that text was relatively relatively detached yeah. compared to some of the other ones. Yeah, right, exactly. There's lots of books called Animal Magnetism, and there was another one by William Gregory. Yeah. And I thought that one was a lot more like uh, the term they use nowadays, again, is woo-woo. You know, yeah, right. it's, it's a lot more <laughs> yeah. like, well, yeah, yeah, lots of, and there's lots of stuff in there about the healing power of crystals, and it, it gets a lot into the the idea that the magnetism can be applied to things other than human beings. Sure. Like, And even Mesmer said, I know this might have just been a, a boast, but certain people like Deleuze, who was a librarian in, in France at the time, and also I think a philosopher in his own right, had said that the patients that Mesmer had, the patients were so numerous that eventually what he did was he magnetized a tree mm. and he just had people touch the tree. <laughs> and that was what happened. And uh, in the beginning, they used these tubs full of water and the tubs were filled with water that was supposedly magnetized. It was full of iron filings and stuff. And they would pass rods into the tub and then touch the patients with these rods. I'm going to quote from Deleuze's account of the Mesmer experiments now. And that's the 18th century Deleuze, not the 20th century French philosopher. The late 18th century, yeah, you're right. They drew near to each other, touching hands, arms, knees, or feet. The handsomest, youngest, and most robust magnetizers held also an iron rod with which they touched the dilatory, or stubborn patients. The rods and ropes had all undergone a preparation, and in a very short space of time, the patients felt the magnetic influence. The women, being the most easily affected, were almost at once seized with fits of yawning and stretching. Their eyes closed, their legs gave way, and they seemed to suffocate. In vain did musical glasses and harmonicas resound, the piano and the voices re-echo. These supposed aids only seemed to increase 
the patient's convulsive movements. Sardonic laughter, piteous moans, and torrents of tears burst forth on all sides. The bodies were thrown back in spasmodic jerks. The respirations sounded like death rattles. The most terrifying symptoms were exhibited. Then suddenly the actors of this strange scene would frantically or rapturously rush towards each other, either rejoicing and embracing or thrusting away their neighbors with every appearance of horror. Another room was padded and presented another spectacle. There, women beat their heads against padded walls or rolled on the cushion-covered floor in fits of suffocation. In the midst of this panting, quivering throng, Mesmer, dressed in a lilac coat, moved about, extending a magic wand toward the least suffering, halting in front of the most violently excited and gazing steadily into their eyes, while he held both their hands in his, bringing the middle fingers in immediate contact to establish communication. At another moment he would, by a motion of open hands and extended fingers, operate with the great current, crossing and uncrossing his arms with wonderful rapidity to make the final passes. So, yeah, it's a very picturesque description. Yeah. Again, this is seen as a good thing, being therapeutic, and I can see how no matter what was happening in those rooms, you could see that it might have been kind of a release for people. And a lot of them, again, we were upper class French citizens who perhaps felt that they needed some kind of a release with their fellows, <laughs> I think. And that maybe it was just a chance to let loose. I don't know. Or maybe Mesmer really was onto something. But like I said, it wasn't long before he was dismissed as a charlatan, even if he had started out with good intentions. Yep. He gained a lot of money and some power from his antics. And many people believe in him, which is surmised to be part of the reason why people were so easily hypnotized. So again, according to the commission, it comes down to faith, imagination, and will. And also the concept of imitation. Now, eventually, when Mesmer's sort of followers or those that would come after him started to go into practice certain aspects of the whole thing were ditched the metal tubs were among the first thing to go one of his disciples a man named Puigur, he is supposedly one of the first to have done away with this reported hysteria and fits and instead replaced with calm slumberousness in his patients and this is of course a much more palatable form of hypnotism. The word hypnotism, by the way, uh, was first coined in 1850, and this Puigur also had many patients, and there were many societies formed in France for the furtherance of mesmeric studies. And uh, the term itself was coined by James Braid, an Englishman, and again, the idea was that hypnotism was supposed to be therapeutic and restorative, and sometimes clairvoyant and again now we get into some weird territory because supposedly those in very deep hypnotic trance can exhibit clairvoyant abilities yeah so they can see objects with their eyes closed that's a big one and although this is contested by many materialization is also a recorded phenomenon according to these people so and this is going to be a major element of many of the stories tonight we're in fact going to carry on we've got a neat little trio of episodes planned or at least two and the next one will a lot of the phenomena described in the deeper states of hypnotic trance will tie over into the next episode yeah. and braid's theory was that sleep could be induced by physical action a sort of exhaustion of the nerves in the eyes by, for example, concentrating steadily for a length of time on a bright or perhaps moving object. Braid said there was no fluid or external agents at all other than the operator of the hypnosis. He wrote down some basic tenets as well, and I'm going to quote now from, well, actually paraphrase because there's too much to actually quote, but from uh, Complete Hypnotism, Mesmerism, Mind Reading, and Spiritualism by A. Alpheus published in 1903, so obviously much later, but so it was a paraphrase too. And there's a lot of rules involved, and there's three essential tenets here that say these are people that 
He says, idiots, babies, and the hopelessly insane can't be hypnotized. <laughs> he also says, none can be hypnotized unless the operator can make him concentrate his attention for a reasonable length of time. So you'd have a lot of trouble with some people because it takes, it takes a long time in order to put somebody under hypnosis. And if they've never been hypnotized before by that person, it takes longer. So right. the idea, and we see this in the stories that we're going to do tonight, is that some of these people have been, they've worked with this operator or the two have worked as a team of some kind for quite some time. So by the end, they're quite susceptible. And there's various descriptions of just how susceptible a person can be. And again, opposition to that, whether that's really a thing or not. And we also say that neurotic people are difficult to hypnotize and in this case we're getting a contradiction of what was said in the initial commission and by Mesmer because this is essentially stating that people with an irregular action of the nervous system are more difficult to hypnotize. There is definitely this misconception of the hypnotizer as this really powerful Svengali kind of person who can make people do things. Oh, what's that movie? The She Creature. It's like this woman, she, she gets hypnotized by this evil mesmerist and she becomes some kind of like fish person or something like that and who's killing people. And yeah, I think it sort of ties into this idea of the double consciousness, which is described in several sources, Yeah, but comes from this idea that a person in trance is in a higher state of being, consciousness. And this consciousness is aware of itself, and it is aware of everything that goes on in the normal waking course of things. But when a person returns to his normal state, he will not remember anything from this altered state of consciousness. So this is described in some sources as an almost celestial state of being, and essentially the person under hypnosis attains this angelic countenance to their face and their voice becomes very soft and gentle and almost this heavenly aura is around them. And then afterwards, when they return to normal consciousness, they feel regenerated and they feel essentially better about their state of self and physically and mentally. So the poem that was read at the beginning of this episode is a poem, The Magnetic Lady to Her Patients by uh, Percy Shelley. And uh, although there's not a ton of context to the poem, that seems to be what he's describing, yep. which is pretty cool in a number of ways, not least of which is that most magnetizers as described in the source material are men. Right. But we will see an example of well, we'll see a couple of examples, actually, we will, of yes. women magnetizers throughout this. And two different approaches to them. Two very different approaches, yes. So there's there's many different schools in the whole hypnosis, I guess, what, what word am I looking for? Sort of the agglomeration of thoughts, and sometimes they're contradictory. Oh, yeah, yeah. You get the French and the English school, again, which are quite different. The French school is a bit more open to the idea that the mesmerist has a certain power, or at least that the power that maybe some may be more successful at hypnotizing than others and some patients might need to find the right person to be able to fall under a hypnotic trance whereas the english school maintains that there's actually no power in the mesmerizer whatsoever and that anybody can mesmerize and that it's entirely in the subject denoting whether they will be susceptible or not how open they are to suggestion and so on the two differ slightly, but in the general mechanics of things, they seem to be more or less the same. And there's also, of course, there's the opposite of what I described, which is the neurotic theory, which says that neurotic people are more easily hypnotized than the others, than so-called normal people who are, I guess, regulated in their will and consciousness to such an extent, and their nerves are so calm right, that this doesn't happen to them. Obviously now, it does seem that the general trend was towards a refining of the hypnotic process. And it's been called many things, like sleep waking. And nowadays, I think most people perceive it as being quite calm and orderly. But that's certainly not 
the way it was initially described. The Again, the consciousness of the mesmerized person is described as being entirely separate and distinct from his ordinary consciousness. He's not a different individual, of course, but the same individual in a different and distinct phase of his being, and that phase definitely being a higher one. There is also sometimes described a loss of identity or an inability to name the self or others, and referring to himself in the person of the operator. So again, there's this dislocation of consciousness and there's lots of, it's brought up a kind of an interesting thing for me because like sometimes you'll see in media and such somebody being hypnotized in order to reveal a truth or something like that. Right. And sometimes you'll be like, so a person open to suggestion or a person who is prone to suggestion might not be able to name someone specifically. But if you looked at them and you said, was it John Smith? then they might be more likely to say yes or no. And right. that's kind of right. the kind of response that you want. And again, in terms of the idea of clairvoyance, I think this altered state of consciousness is sort of almost, again, the, the way it was linked in the countenance to like heavenliness, for example, almost has a similarity to death. And when you talk to spirits and when you talk to people who are a past beyond this world, which is a power that apparently the deeply hypnotized have, often their answers will be basic, but very truthful. Mm -hmm. So again, getting very specific knowledge might be difficult, but getting answers to uh, binary questions like yes or no is a very simple and straightforward thing. There are potential dangers besides the aforementioned erotic connotations in mesmerism and there, there can be inexperienced operators and somebody who is nervous for example can cause sympathetic vibrations that can be communicated to the mesmerized gregory maintains that the proper method of ending the sleep is upward or reverse passes and if that's not possible for whatever reason the person should just be left on their own and will eventually wake up and be normal this could take anywhere from one hour to a day, but usually it's not supposed to take long. But we have an example coming up of a very unusual use of mesmerism. And in fact, connected very closely to the concept of death. When we come back, we will be discussing some works of Edgar Allan Poe, the famous American author from the early 1800s. have discussed Edgar Allan Poe before briefly. We're going to be spending a little bit more time with him today and the final time we discuss Poe or I think will be the final time will probably be our longest discussion of Poe but for now we're going to talk about three stories. A little bit of background first not too much but Poe was born to theater parents in 1809 in Boston but they quickly moved and it was a theater troupe because they were moving everywhere but the other thing was that Poe as a child, was passed around a lot, so he didn't really stay in one family situation for too long. Like, starting from the time he was one month old, he was essentially being passed around from foster family to relatives to... And this pretty much happened up until the time when both his parents died, and he ended up staying with this merchant named John Allen, which is where he gets his middle name. But Allen never officially adopted him, so he always kind of was like a guest in his house almost. He did foot the money for him to go to university though, or at least some money, but it wasn't enough for one reason or another, whether it was really not enough or whether Poe simply misspent, because I mean, he was described by his school teachers as being willful and wayward. <laughs> and so we don't know, but in effect, he was kind of left out to dry and the Allens didn't really, John Allen didn't really want to keep supporting him. In fact, when he came back from university after being broke after a year, it was pretty much thrown out of the house. And he wrote John Allen a bunch of times and said, like, I can hardly afford to eat. And 
didn't get much sympathy back, and then suddenly Poe seemed to vanish for a while, and during this time he had moved from Richmond, Virginia to Boston again, and in Boston he assumed, uh, well, he <laughs> adopted an assumed identity, uh, nom de plure, as it were. Uh, it was indeed a French name, I believe, Henri Midet. And, as you know, he was fascinated with French culture and France, and uh, French was always one of his best subjects in school. And you can see that he's almost boastfully proud in his fiction of his knowledge of Europe and France, because he shows off a lot, I think, just, you know, putting in whole paragraphs of French just because he can. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, I mean, I love Poe. I think Poe is great. He has certain quirks, and it just becomes more interesting the more you find out about him. But, yeah, so he was under this assumed name for a while, I guess essentially to avoid his creditors. Like, they would literally show up, like, during social gatherings to harass him, apparently. So... I guess he just thought, uh, it's time to disappear. Yeah. And who doesn't want to do that sometimes? Right. Unfortunately, nowadays, it's a lot more difficult than it was in the 1820s. So Poe did kind of get his start in writing around that time, late 1820s. He did have a book published called Tamerlane and Other Poems, and it was mostly stuff that he'd written when he was in his teens. The book was not reviewed, didn't get a lot of attention, etc., Books of poetry by teenagers tend not to do. Right. Uh, he tried to start newspaper work, but the newspaper that he started to write for immediately went bankrupt. And he also worked in a warehouse, but the warehouse owner absconded and nobody got paid. So he had a lot of not so great luck. Yeah, uh, it seems that way. As a child uh, or as a young man. In 1829, though, he was attending the military academy at West Point and he was taught by uh, Joseph de Comon. He was a French instructor at the Academy de Comon. Also happened to deliver the first lectures on mesmerism in the United States. And it's not absolutely known that Poe was present at any of these lectures, but it seems likely. And much later, when he was already well established, Poe definitely did attend the 1844 lectures of the mesmerist Andrew Jackson Davis. Yeah. And he did a review of his W. Newnham's book, Human Magnetism, around the same time. The dissertation from 1950, written by William Baker called The Influence of Mesmerism in 19th Century American Literature, states that there is a book called The Philosophy of Animal Magnetism by a Gentleman of Philadelphia published in 1837, which has sometimes been attributed to Poe's authorship, though Baker kind of pushes back on this a little bit and says, gives the argument for each side of the case. But there's certainly connections there with Poe for quite some time after 1829. Yeah, and I did read about that philosophy of animal magnetism book as well. And I wasn't sure because, I mean, it seemed like the arguments against it being Poe were sound but who knows right like he definitely wasn't above taking pseudonyms so maybe this right. just was something that he was not didn't get around to claiming yet yeah because one thing that is it definitely seems to be a thing with poe is that much of his fiction was published anonymously too mm -hmm. at first but he was never shy about taking ownership of it later on yeah and one of the stories we're reading tonight was definitely published in that vein now, his letters and, and the marginalia from around then definitely portray a lot of interest in the subject of mesmerism. Yeah. The first story that I want us to talk about tonight is the mesmeric revelation. And this is a very, very simple story written in 1844 and published in the Columbian magazine. The mesmeric revelation is a relatively plotless tale of a narrator by the way, just let me back up. I want to say this now before I forget. So we've been doing this for 11 episodes now, and although we weren't too firm about the summaries in the first few episodes and didn't do it much, we've kind of been doing this for the last while, and a lot of the stuff that we've done has been the kind of stuff that uh, it doesn't really matter. Like, we, we talked about this last time, but spoiling Simsonia, I don't think anybody is bothered. No. <laughs> but we are discussing the stories in depth, and 
some of these are really short, so I don't think it's really appropriate to use the word spoilers, but like, especially when we do longer stuff, we will probably reveal things up to the ending and things about the characters that you might want to know from reading the story. Mm -hmm. So although we're not trying to discourage anybody from listening, definitely keep that in mind as we go. In certain cases, I will probably try not to say too much, but we'll see as it goes. It's pretty much impossible to discuss a lot of things without getting to their core. Yeah, absolutely. So Mesmeric Revelation is very short, and it's skeptic about the soul narrator, and he's practicing mesmerism on a person. So I guess he's probably one of those people who practices mesmerism for its practical applications. But whether he believes in clairvoyance and such at this point, probably not. Yeah, it seemed to me more like medical healing and therapy that way. Yeah, he's not really a character in any real sense. He's just there to ask questions. So he's mesmerized this person, Van Kirk, who's a tuberculosis patient and is probably going to die soon. And this seems to be in order to alleviate his pain symptoms and so on, as you will. He feels an opening of his pathways when mesmerizing, a kind of exaltation, and this isn't the case in the real world. So the mesmerism is obviously doing him some good. He has this idea that he can hypnotize Van Kirk and interview him and ask him some questions as he is on the point of death. And he reveals that mesmeric trance is death-like, and because Van Kirk is ready to die, he's pretty happy and he's content with things and from henceforward in the story we get a whole bunch of questions on the nature of god and van kirk in a halting voice tries to explain all this stuff and this is apparently pretty much poe's view of the world that he's describing and although there are a couple of antecedents possibly mentioned it does seem like poe sort of generated a lot of this stuff on his own but at the same time it doesn't seem that antithetical to mainstream sort of post-enlightened American thought of that time period. So he's basically saying that there is God, but God is organized, like some kind of organized matter that's... Oh, how, help me out here. <laughs> Unparticled matter, and it's some really wild physics yeah, with regards yeah. to that and the spiritual immortality versus the body and the nature of the body. Yes. He says the organs are contrivances by which the individual is brought into sensible relation with particular classes and forms of matter to right. the exclusion of other classes of yeah. the forms. <laughs> and there's a lot of that kind of stuff. He says there's an infinity of rudimental beings and angels see space as having substance and and so forth. It, it actually does remind me a fair bit of the Cavendish and her communication with the spirits yeah, in absolutely. the Blazing World. Yeah, and, and we'll see certainly more of this next episode, but the link between, I guess, a trance either brought on by near death or death itself and the traversing of the spiritual realm seemed to be quite linked in a lot of yeah. ways. But I guess what I was thinking mostly of was the use of spirit to question uh, the fabric of reality and right. God right. and so forth. That reminded me a lot of Cavendish, and because that seemed to be what she was trying to work out in her book. And I feel like Poe is a bit more like, this is the way the world is. It's, he says the gift of free will is to be like unorganized from the whole, so you're not like part of the part of the, I guess, cosmic fabric of things. Mm -hmm. So the beauty or the, I guess, the glory of free will is individuality. And so when we die, we lose that, and then we become incorporated into the whole. And that is what brings us the joy of heavenliness and so on. I think that's what he's saying. Anyway. <laughs> and he says, you know, that the beginning is God. So in the beginning, there was no individuality. And that came about over time. And now it's something that we can rejoice in until it's our time to pass beyond the world. Right. And he also talks about there being forms of matter that man doesn't know anything about, which is very much true. Mm -hmm. was certainly even more true at the time. I mean... There's so much work been done in particle physics since, right? Oh, never mind basic chemistry. Oh, yeah. yeah. Our understanding of the world since the 1840s has vastly 
vastly increased. But, I mean, people like Poe were thinking about this a lot. Clearly. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And Poe was extremely proud of this story, too. So I think this is, does reflect on his personal beliefs and interest and his general kind of philosophy on how this all ties together. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that Poe po definitely had his ear to the ground in terms of everything that was going on at the time. He's a very, very well-read person. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. voracious. And he wrote about a lot of, like, he has perhaps more essays and reviews and such than he does fiction. Yeah. So yeah. there's a lot of stuff. And this story, I think the reason why he might have felt particularly connected to this is because, yeah, it seems like this is actually what he believed. Talks about the universal thought and the universal mind. Sounds, yeah, again, kind of what a lot of people actually believe nowadays. Mm -hmm. And it seems maybe, again, a little bit hard to believe that a mesmerized person would have uh, knowledge of all this cosmic schema when it's stuff that they don't know in their waking state. But I guess, again, it's just this elevated consciousness that brings them closer to this universal whole and right. so on. The boundary between the material and the infinite. Yeah. And one thing in that book you mentioned that cited is coincidentally another book that we found as a resource for this the facts and mesmerism by the reverend townsend and in this book now i don't know anything about this reverend townsend and it was one of the things that i was going to look up because i don't know if he used to be a i guess i'm assuming he used to be a church like a reverend of a church or something like that but his some of his ideas seem very strange for a christian preacher <laughs> i don't know it's very odd but anyway in this book, some of the same concepts are espoused. So, again, it could be that this was an influence on Poe, and a lot of what he's saying does seem to tie in with the, the theories of higher mesmerism that were being expressed at the time. So, yeah, it's an interesting one. Not much of a plot, obviously. But again, he said in a letter to Thomas Hawley, he said, My own faith is indeed my own. You will find it somewhat detailed in Mesmeric Revelation. Now, I don't really have anything else to say about this. I mean, the theories are interesting. Yeah, to a and point. that's pretty much the entire story. This idea of infinite, I guess, n knowledge around the point of death by a mesmerism. But a story that perhaps describes Poe's belief in mesmerism, but is aiming for a more crowd-pleasing, I guess, horror notion is the facts in the case of Monsieur Valdemar. This story is a really good story, and it's a really famous story by Poe. It's probably... One of my favorite Poe stories. Yeah, I really like this one. Yeah, it's a great little story. This was published the following year in 1845. And I believe that having sort of documented his actual beliefs in the previous story, Poe sort of set out to not exactly pastiche, but just sort of have a little morbid fun with it as he is wont to do. Yeah. <laughs> now, Poe himself is often sort of a walking contradiction i think like he can write so meticulously and dryly like it seems extremely serious but he was also a very humorous person i mean he was very fond of hoaxes and some of the stories are really funny the lesser known stories like the system of dr tar and professor feather for example or lionizing or four beasts in one are like very very humorous stories and Perhaps even his personality, Poe himself, was like often described, particularly by some of the women that knew him, as a, a rather dour character. Sometimes another side of him showed in his writing. And although this story isn't very humorous, it was certainly passed off as a hoax at first. Yeah. And Poe had a little bit of fun kind of maintaining that facade for a little while before admitting that it was pure fiction. Ten years later, Baker notes that he was accused of plagiarizing the novel The Seerist of Prevorst by Justinius Kerner. I don't know how much 
there is to that accusation, but Baker seems to say that on the surface, there's a lot of similarities between the two. Yeah, but again, he also provides a good counter-argument. Right. So it's hard to say. I mean, I feel like he probably drew from a number of sources, yeah, maybe, including absolutely. that one. Yeah, But that one's I'm not familiar with at all. He, no, he I'm, I'm not either, yeah. Yeah, but he does talk about the facts of mesmerism as a potential inspiration as well. Mm -hmm. So in the facts in the case of Monsieur Valdemar, there remains yet one experiment to be performed in mesmerism. Mesmerism at the point of death. So again, we have a very similar theme with the Monsieur Valdemar in question being a writer of some kind, now wasted away from tuberculosis, or phthisis as it was sometimes called at the time. Or consumption, lots of different names for it. Yeah, consumption seems to be the most popular one used in the 19th century. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. It was used by laymen, whereas phthisis, excuse me, that's a hard word to pronounce, <laughs> uh, seems to be more of a medical right. diagnosis. Yeah, so, yeah. And again, we have a character who is a doctor, and we'll see that a few times <laughs> in, through the course of all this. So, and then again, that's not surprising because it seems like physicians were the most common folk to be involved in mesmeric practice. Yeah, absolutely. All throughout the 19th century, basically. So he's a mesmerist, again, uh, this doctor is. But here now he is mesmerizing this sick patient. And this person's normally a poor mesmerism subject, perhaps because of his disordered mind. So again, now we have a depiction of somebody who's particularly nervous and not necessarily prone to mesmerism most of the time. But Valdemar is very resigned to and reasoned with the prospect of his impending death. And so they arrange for Valdemar to summon this physician on the point of like hours before he's going to go. And this man being a prominent writer, he's surrounded by uh, entourage and he has doctors with him at all times. And apparently they know exactly when the last moment's going to come. They've estimated the time exactly, so Valdemar has him summoned a few hours beforehand, and his lungs are pretty much completely useless at this point. So at this point, the physician begins the passes, and in this case, the process seems to take a long time, but eventually the subject falls under, and the doctors are present, and the uh, Pope, I guess. I don't know. You know, it's hard to say. I mean, it's passed off as a hoax. Everybody knows that Poe wasn't a doctor, so right. I guess I can keep saying Poe or the physician, but he makes sure to note that the physicians in the room observe that he's under. And three hours after he's supposed to have been dead, Valdemar still is lying there, and he's now his breathing is gentle and calm, and there's barely a pulse. But they start a very, very slow conversation, with Valdemar saying he wishes to die in this entranced state. There's lots of emphasis of the weirdness of the situation, like the conversation takes hours because Valdemar does not answer quickly, to say the least. And hours later, the body of Valdemar suddenly starts to cadaverize or stiffen very quickly, and uh, this horrible voice utters some very simple words. It says, I am dead, but I mean... You have to read it in the story. I have a lot of quotes in this episode, but I didn't actually pull any from this because I really think the best way to experience this is just to read it. Yeah, and these are all very, very short too. I mean, yeah. I think all these short stories will take 20 minutes at most to read. Exactly, yeah. So he still attempts to answer the narrator's questions, but this time, because his body is stiffened and undergone a process of rigor, there's really not much making sense of what he's saying. So it's this strange, distorted sounds coming from his mouth. Uh, at this point, the ethics of the process come under consideration by the reader, at least. Yeah, because he's been in this state for several months at this point. Yeah, seven months. Uh, he keeps them like this. And none of the other physicians seem to raise any objection to this either. Like they, I think everybody just wants to see what will happen, which makes sense. A lot is made of the groundbreaking qualities of the experiment. Right. So that's why they want to keep it up regardless. They decide finally to wake him up, though, I guess. So it's kind of like wake him up ironically, because I guess at that point they probably even guess that, yeah, once the mesmeric state is halted, 
he'll probably just die normally, right? right? It makes sense. And what he wanted was to die, but he, I guess, didn't quite realize that the state he was in would prolong his life. So again, with the, the passes, presumably in reverse this time, and it's at this point that the horrible end of the story comes. He falls into a mass of liquid putrescence after making a last urgent plea. Quick, quick, put me to sleep or waken me. I say that I am dead. And he keeps screaming. And as he's screaming, his entire body suddenly falls into a puddle of goo, essentially. Yeah, as <laughs> if the mesmeric trance was the only thing holding him together and three months yeah. or however long it's been worth of decomposition happens all at once. It's pretty powerful stuff. And the suddenness of it is pretty great. Yeah. There's no follow-up to that. Like, yeah. the last sentence is literally what happens. Yeah. So, I mean, again, it kind of shows to me the fictional quality of the story, though, because, like, if this were a real scientific report, that's not the way it would end. No, it's absolutely like... not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a very effective horror story ending. Like, yeah. probably one of the most effective there is. So you can't blame Poe, but, like, that's obviously where his heart was lying with this, yeah. I think. And this is certainly the most horror out of any of the Poe stories we're likely to read for the podcast. I mean, that's obviously what he's most known for, but he had a pretty wide variety of, I guess you could say, genres, even though none of them were really codified as genres at the time. Yeah, yeah. The whole hoax nature of it is kind of interesting. I mean, Absolutely. Like, it's yeah. something that I always thought going back many, many years. There's a lot of hoaxes in the modern times, too. Like, make no mistake, one of the ones I can think of is... Uh, Forgive me, listeners, but I don't know every detail of this case, but there was this guy who wrote this book that was really popular in the early 2000s, so his name was James Frey, I think. And he wrote this book called A Million Little Pieces, which was supposed to be the memoir of his time in prison, and he was, like, on the Oprah Winfrey show and everything like that. And this book was, like, a bestseller, and people thought it was this huge revelation, and they loved the hell out of it. And... I don't know the details of whether he was found out. I suspect that to be the case, or whether he just admitted it himself. Uh, considering his multi-million dollar publishing deal, I doubt that. <laughs> but the whole thing was made up, and he never went to prison. None of that stuff ever happened. And once he was found out, suddenly he was dropped, and nobody yep. had any interest in him. And yep. Nobody like it was just oh, it's it's all bull, right? Mm -hmm. So, but that. At first, I thought that was the funniest thing ever, and I was really amused by that. And it is kind of amusing, but it kind of got me thinking back then. And, and it, does a story really need to claim to be fictional? Obviously, you want to read, if you're told that an account is true, I guess you your mind sort of adapts to it in a different way. Yeah, and absolutely. You think yeah. of verisimilitude as being important. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, for the purposes of storytelling, sometimes the lines do blur. And I think Poe is very, very fond of this. He loves to attach very scientific languages to things that are not necessarily always treated that way. And he likes to be so meticulous in his documentation. And, of course, Poe himself, like Mark Twain, was also a person who was fond of revealing the truth behind hoaxes. Mm. So it's a double whammy there. You get somebody who's interested in the playful nature of doing it, but also perhaps showing people how it could be done and what to look for. But yeah, I mean, he also has this morbid sensibility, which is probably one of the more well-known things about him that people who don't necessarily read a lot of Poe know about him. And he sure loves to describe sickness and decay and things oh, like that. Yeah. I love the way he's describing the lungs, because he's like, if you thought the left lung was bad, wait until you see the other one. Yeah. Like, <laughs> It was really, again, it was kind of, it was morbid, but it was really funny. Yeah, he's like, very good at that kind of imagery, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. At one point, he describes Valdemar going into the mesmeric trance, and he describes him as uh, sinking fast. Uh, it almost seems like a description of drown, like yeah. in the magnetic fluid, I right, suppose. Right. And again, the drowning motif is something that Poe does come back to sometimes, and mm -hmm. He has a story called, a satirical story called How to Write a Blackwood Article. And it's a story of, about a woman who's told to write an account of what it's like to drown. So she tries to drown herself so she can write about it. Yeah. <laughs> There's again, the mesmerized person is described as having an uneasy inward examination 
uh, a gaze like that reflects uneasy inward examination. The gaze of the mesmerized person eyes seem to be moving in inexplicable directions. He says, I have been sleeping, now I am dead. It's so simple, but the way it's described is in the story is really chilling. Extremely chilling. Yeah. Another point he says that the words that Valdemar is saying, he says they're well calculated to convey the messages that he's saying, which is an interesting choice of words. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of that old radio series, Suspense. They would say that the tales that they were about to tell were well calculated to keep you in suspense. <laughs> right. Uh, and, and this is totally the kind of story they might have done, too. Uh, yeah, I mean, Poe was really a pioneer in that kind of thing. These stories in particular more than Hans Fall, given that they're considerably shorter and have a lot more punch to them, especially Voldemort. The other two, I think, are relatively similar in that they're going for a very quick effect, though it takes a lot of turns to get there. Yeah, yeah, definitely so. And yeah, the ending is, is truly great. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like a horror story should have an ending like that. Like, yeah. Sometimes they're frustrating, right? Because they, they want you to feel the ambiguity. They want you to feel the uncertainty. Uh, and all my favorite, uh, most of my favorite horror movie endings are like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, like the thing from John Carpenter, like right. that is the perfect ending. Where you don't know, is either of them the thing or neither of them the thing? Right. Are they going to find out? Or are they going to kill each other first? Mm -hmm. Are they going to freeze to death? Like it is enough to kind of drive you a little bit insane. Yeah. And that is how a horror story should end. So... Yeah, I mean, you could go more into, well, this is what happened when we cleaned up the mess. And with our primitive abilities, we analyzed the composition of the protoplasm before us. But we don't get any of that. Yeah. And that's a good thing. I mean, Yeah, it wouldn't really add anything to the story. I mean, I think no. Poe is very mindful of the essential elements and ingredients that make up his stories. A lot of his work is this length, Hans Fall being one of the longer of his short pieces, but Pym is like the only novel length thing he wrote, and even that's not too long. Yeah, and even that one end, and that one ends very abruptly. <laughs> yeah, I think that's frustrated people for a very long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And of course, the depiction of cataleptic states or prolonged pre-death states are very common in Poe as well. Yeah, yeah. The fall of the House of Usher has that kind of notion. Uh, right. It doesn't specifically mention mesmerism, but it has a person in that at this state where you think she's dead and then she kind of comes back and then she's dead. So it's like, yeah, it's been duplicated in a lot of Poe adaptation films that aren't House of Usher because it's a twist that's so good. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Premature Burial was another one. So speaking of adaptations, this story was adapted in Roger Corman's Tales of Terror. Really good movie with three Poe stories that are adapted, but because... They're all short stories. Even with the three stories, they felt the need to add a bunch of stuff from other yeah. post stories. And, <laughs> yeah, and also, you know, other things like the the adaptation of this one has a messed up love situation, kind of like the the one in... The Hawthorne? The uh, in, Rappuccini's daughter? or uh, No. Yeah, it, yeah, that's that's the one, that one, the one I was thinking of. Yeah, Twice Told Tales. Yeah, right. But it wasn't Rappuccini's daughter. It was Dr. Heider's experiment. They had yeah, the yeah. Love so thing and, and, uh, yeah. that movie was, even though the Hawthorne stories were uh, a little bit earlier, that movie was sort of a, a response to this one, in, I think, in a lot of ways. Yeah, the same yeah. kind of approach with Roger Corman at the head and Vincent Price playing Vincent Price and all of his roles. Yeah, I haven't yeah. seen the Poe adaptations of this era in... Oh, quite you some have time. to watch them. They're so good. Yeah, it's it's been a They're... while since I've seen them. Um, yeah. I, I'd like to watch them again. Oh, you have uh, seen? Okay, yes. Yeah, Sorry, it, just, it's, it's been at least 15, 20 years, though. Yeah. So it's not, not exactly fresh in my mind. Yeah, this one has Price as the Valdemar-esque character. Well, right. I mean, I guess he is Valdemar. And Basil Rathbone is the mesmerist. Yeah. So that's interesting. I mean, Rathbone was not in too many of these. I think, I think he might have been in one other one. Was it The Raven? I don't remember. See, I'm showing now. Now I'm showing a gap in my knowledge, but <laughs> I think he was in. He might have been in one more, but anyway, he was, of course, at that time, quite an older actor and perhaps not as 
sought after as he had been in the 1930s and 40s. So presumably American International Pictures was able to afford him. Right. That's must have been nice. And he did um, a fair amount of Poe readings as well, too. Oh, he certainly did. Yeah, yeah. Of course, he was Sherlock Holmes, and we will be getting to the writer of Sherlock Holmes stories momentarily. Yes. The next story is The Tale of the Ragged Mountains, as I had just said. And this one was also written in 1844. And this story is one that I had not read before, unlike the other stories. So this one was new to me. It's short also, and it's pretty cool. At first, I didn't really think there was that much to make of it. But the more I thought of it, the more I'm like, yeah, this is kind of... There's more to this than I thought. Yeah. So... We uh, describe this tall, gaunt gentleman named uh, Augustus Bedlow, and he's in Charlottesville, Virginia in 1827. He's being described. The story is written later. It's The narrator says that he's writing this in 1845. Yeah, and I think the story takes place in like 1827 or something like that. Yeah, it's 1827. This guy in Charlottesville, he's this young man, supposedly, but he's described as a young old man or an old young man he's a rather sick man and he's hired this physician named templeton to permanently look after his medical needs this he's quite well off but this dr templeton is as well as a physician of course he's also a mesmerist or at least he's a uh, convert of mesmerism and he uses magnetism to alleviate his patient's woes and just like the doctor in the mesmeric revelation in 1827 in America, Poe points out, mesmerism was next to unknown. Indeed, this was before these aforementioned lectures. Right, right. The narrator of the story is uh, writing about it 20 years later, and he describes the Ragged Mountains as this chain of hills located in the southwest of Virginia. And Bedlow, who likes to consume morphine, is he likes to wander around this area with his dog, and one day he sets out in the morning and he finds this mysterious ravine which he enters and gets hopelessly lost in. And he then sees a man apparently running from something. A beast! It's a hyena! He must be dreaming! And he's quite sure of this, but no attempts to wake himself up seem to work. And he realizes as he keeps walking, that he's been transported to some kind of jungle. And he finds this majestic, crowded city. And he kind of describes it. It looks vaguely eastern. There's lots of mosques and stuff and people wandering around. There's sacred bulls and apes wandering around too, I guess. Or at least the apes are wandering around. It's cool, though. It's, it's picturesque and strange. Like, it's got that kind of fascination with the mysterious eastern lands that a lot of people had at that time i guess right. he falls in with some sort of procession and he describes the people he doesn't really like the look of what's going on it looks like some kind of battle and he realizes that it's british soldiers versus perhaps indians and he concludes it must be a rebellion and he ends up joining the british forces and he doesn't seem to really recognize anything specific other than the need to fight. And during this time, he's struck by a poison arrow and dies in horrible gasping agony. And, and then he feels his soul rise from his body in a sense of non-entity and coldness. And suddenly he finds he's back in his original form. And now I guess it's, I don't know, light again, but he can make it home. And he's told Templeton about this story and the narrator of the piece, presumably Poe. And he says, uh, you must have been dreaming. For surely you don't think that you are dead. But Templeton has another explanation. He knows where Bedlow's been. And he shows him a portrait. And it's 
supposed to be a depiction of a scene from Calcutta in the year 1780. And he talks about his friend, this Mr. Oleb, to whom Bedlow bears this striking resemblance. And now things get really strange, and we get more implication than anything else, as Templeton essentially describes that the only reason he agreed to do this job was because of this supposed resemblance. Right. So what he's describing is this insurrection that supposedly actually took place at that time. And this is where his friend had been killed. And Poe describes how a week later, Bedlow really does die. And supposedly it's medical complications. I mean, he has been sick and all this. But it turns out that he'd been undergoing a leech treatment. Yeah, he describes how during the leeching, there was accidentally a venomous vermicular sangsu introduced. And so essentially some kind of venomous worm, I guess, rather than a standard leech. And it killed him. So that's pretty uh, nasty. <laughs> yeah, I would say so. Yeah, it was a nasty end to the story. And it was kind of... I like this one because it, it didn't seem like... It seemed like there were things going on that not everyone was aware of. And that right. the narrator probably didn't... Des or not the narrator, but the Bedlow guy probably didn't deserve much of this. No. It yeah. reminds me of The Clock That Went Backwards. Yeah, for sure. But with a nastier twist to it somehow. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's a little a little less going on than there is in that story with the whole time travel thing. But there's this idea, too, of, uh, like, metempsychosis. Right. And at the same time, though, in that American mesmerism book, sorry, I forget the name of it already. Baker's. Uh, we just talked about it, though. Yeah. Uh, yes. So he says, he kind of points out, which I thought was interesting, that the story is not necessarily a metempsychosis story. It's, it is a mesmerism story because he's described how... Templeton was a mesmerist, and he believes in this connection between the two people, which may not really be a true connection, I think, is what's implied. Yeah, though we do have a rather interesting coincidence at the very end, where in his obituary, Bedlow was spelled B-E-D-L-O, yeah. omitting the E, which is, of course, Oldeb reversed. Right, so it's almost like Poe saying... It was a coincidence, or was it? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Definitely an interesting one. There's a talk about the, the magnetism and how it's used to connect various people together, I suppose. Right, right. There's some similarities to the way that's described, the Doyle story that we'll be doing momentarily. I guess the snake venom thing, too, mirrors the, the poison arrow death. Mm. So, I mean, that leads me to the ultimate question I guess we're supposed to be asking ourselves, but was Templeton responsible for Bedlow's death? Right. And, I mean, the suggestion to me is yes. Uh, yeah. There's, because we read horror stories, and because that's our thing, I think, and thrillers and such, <laughs> which Poe was kind of the instigator of, of a lot of those things. But I mean, Yeah, he, he, certainly one of the earliest, biggest major influences. Yeah, but even then, like, it's almost like he is aware of the conventions. He's like, right. I don't have to say it. Like, your mind will go there if you yep. understand the story. Right. And you'll be like, so he killed him, right? Like, And, you know, there's the whole thing of the whole situation. Like, it's, it was a battle between colonists and the colonized, right? Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know, like, it gets me to thinking, like, is there even a, was there a political implication to all this that nobody else knew about? The doctor said he was his friend. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. It's strange. It's strange. Presumably, though, this OLAP was on the side of the British, too, though. Yeah, I mean, I would have so, so. I mean, it's certainly not a very English name, but... <laughs> no, but, uh, I mean, who knows? The English Empire was enormous at the time, so... <laughs> yeah, yeah. But a part of me thinks that that might just be, again, Poe doing one of his funny things and, like, coming up with this funny name. Sure. Kind of like he did in the Hans Fall story, right? right? Yeah. And he's coming up with <laughs> Poe's humor is a, a difficult thing to come to grips with sometimes, but it's pretty cool. Like, it's, there's, there's something, something unusual about it and different for its time, especially. So that was a fun story. I liked it. Not the most developed thing, but it didn't need to be. And part of it is, is saying just what needs to be needs to be said, 
to kind of get you thinking about it a little more than you would under the normal circumstances of the situation, I think. Right. And, and it works. Uh, it works. Yeah. Yeah, I think it worked really well. So uh, you enjoyed these stories. Yes, I did. Yeah. I thought Voldemort was the strongest out of the three, but I really liked all three of them. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that Mesmeric Revelation is a little... I don't know. I mean, it's not much of a story, and it's a little bit... I don't think pedantic is quite the right word in this case, but... No, it gets a little too into the weird philosophy of... I, experimental is the wrong word, but maybe theoretical physics with respect to mesmerism and spiritualism and stuff like that. Yeah. And again, I was a bit more impatient with the, the cabinet, I think, because it went on a bit more. Right. It certainly so, did. Yeah. This is such a, a short one that it yeah. doesn't really matter too much. Now that we've discussed Edgar, and yes, we will be returning to him to discuss the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym at some point, probably in several months. But for now, we will leave Poe and leave the United States and travel south to what is now Argentina to discuss one of its most prominent 19th century woman writers. Juana Manuela Goriti was born in 1818 in Rosario de la Frontera in Salta province in what was I think then called the United Provinces of Rio de la Plata, now known as Argentina. She grew up in a wealthy liberal family and her father was a politician who supported Argentine independence. Her background was quite privileged, but this time in South America was marked by continual civil unrest and strife and regimes were seemingly changing constantly and as a result of all this there were many relocations of the family and her father's fortune sort of fell from favor during the duration of this rosas regime the family was more or less exiled so i believe it was at this time that she lived in what would become bolivia and it's there that she met her future husband, Manuel Isidro Belzu. And he was an army captain and become president of Bolivia. Uh, she was 15 years old when they married. And uh, she bore two daughters for him, but he ended up more or less abandoning her, it looks like. But it seemed like they still sort of had an on-again, off-again thing going on. And she never really spoke ill of him and always sort of supported his ideals. He was murdered in 1865, and Juana spoke at his funeral. She moved to Peru initially with her children, and although they would relocate soon afterward, and this might have been the, the move might have been precipitated by a scandalous affair. It was not totally known, but it seems like it may have been the case. In Lima, she set up a school for girls, and she also started becoming involved in journalism. She was known for hosting these salons where these prestigious artists and social movers of the time would congregate and they'd discuss sort of issues of the day. She was a strong believer in women's rights and she often spoke out in favor of general progress and also indigenous people's rights, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. Uh, and A major part of the South American experience. Yeah, yeah. I don't really know a lot about it, but like, I mean, it's it's an interesting area of things that certainly seems worth looking into more. Yeah, I think Quechua has like 3 million native speakers today or something like that. So the indigenous populations in South America survive far much more in greater numbers than in the United States. That's, uh, that's really interesting. Yeah. And she was supposed to be fluent in several indigenous languages as well. So... Her brand of feminism seems especially geared towards education. She wanted women to be able to express themselves in writing and the arts. And I guess at the time was something that was perceived very negatively by the Catholic Church, especially in Peru. She believed that writing shouldn't be considered a luxury. She said that it should be a way of living and a way of earning an income. 
And this was something that many women, of course, found very difficult at the time as they were domesticated, obviously. This was a big deal to her, and she was a strong proponent of education and so on, as, as has been said. She was definitely somebody who, I guess because she had been born into some fortunate circumstances and kind of always had a nostalgia, perhaps, for certain aspects of that, although maybe I'm reading too much into it because I'm sure she's talked about this a lot in her work that I haven't read. Yeah. But she seemed to have been a little bit concerned with how she would make a living, and that makes sense. I mean, she wanted to be an independent woman, and she was worried about you know, how she would end up. So it led to some things, though, that could possibly be interpreted as compromises later in her novels. Like, for example, having sponsors that she inserted into the text. So it's kind of like an early example of product placement, almost. Right. It's interesting. And because she refused to attend school after, I think, the age of eight, and she just didn't, I guess, didn't want to go to the, because they were probably all convents, I'm assuming at the time, for women. Yeah. Run by the Catholic Church. And, well, let's put it this way. In Quebec in the 1950s, my mom went to, you know, that's where she went to school. And this was over 100 years later. And at that time, they were still... It still seems like it was a very unpleasant kind of institution for women to be educated in sometimes. So Yeah, we won't get to him on this podcast, though. I looked into his bibliography for his chances to explore his work. But Victor Hugo, of course, wrote a very famous part of Les Miserables where he oh, yeah. rails on the convent system for like 200 pages. Yeah, and that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. And it's... Maybe less of a deal a hundred years later, but certainly the French-speaking people, especially in rural Quebec, had a lot of things to say about sure, the absolutely. church. Yep. So, but Thomas Meehan, anyway, surmises that perhaps because of this and in her specific trends in reading, uh, her ideas about science and the supernatural were sort of unusual. And he uses a less kind word, I think, <laughs> like erroneous. Yeah. But... As well as poetry readings and political discourse and so on, spiritual seances during her salons were not uncommon. She did go on. She lived a very long life, actually. I can't remember. I think I wrote down her... Was it 1890? 1892, yeah. 1892, yeah. So she lived a, a long life. She traveled a lot throughout South America. She seemed to have founded and or run several newspapers. Mm -hmm. She was a nurse on the battlefield in Chile and Peru during skirmishes against the Spanish. And she ended up moving back to Argentina in 1878, where she continued to write. And she was respected at the time, it looks yeah. like. Very well read during her lifetime, but another one of these figures that falls into obscurity a couple decades after their death. Yeah, well, certainly, I mean... I don't know if that is the case in Argentina or not, but certainly in this part of the world, like I'm just even seeing the names of all the authors mentioned in the introduction to the Dreams and Realities book. Yeah. I didn't recognize any of them, pretty much. Mm -hmm. That's a whole area that is completely unknown to me. I mean, I know of some 20th century South American writers, and I've certainly read most of Borges short stories and stuff, but right. that's about it, really. Yeah. And I think most sources on 19th century Latin American sci-fi or sci-fi adjacent stuff, point that out, that none of these authors are really well-read within the English world, and a lot of them haven't been translated into English at all. So that's something we're definitely going to explore further in future episodes. Yeah, and I look forward to that. Yeah, me too. Yeah, so she wrote a lot of novels and short stories, certainly quite a vast output of work, I think. Yeah. But we're doing two very short stories. The first one's title in English is He Who Listens May Hear to His Regret, Confidence of a Confidence. And this story was written in 1865. The title of the story in Spanish, which I'm not going to attempt to say, but you can if you have it handy and want to, <laughs> but it's a, a common saying in Spanish. Yeah. Maybe in Latin American Spanish particularly. I'm the sure. dialects are different, for sure, and a lot of the expressions are too, though... It's difficult to say, without being a native speaker, exactly how widespread that expression was in the Spanish world. But, I mean, it's it's certainly got commonalities probably all over. And, yeah, and essentially, right. it's beware, if you listen at the keyhole, beware you might, what you might hear. Exactly. You might not yeah. like it, kind right. of thing. Yeah. So, it's a pretty tantalizing title, and it's a story of 
a man who begins this confession to a woman friend of his and he says that he's done something really terrible and he wants absolution she seems eager to hear his confession but she doesn't really take it very seriously and says she's not going to keep it a secret and he grumbles about this and complains about women but decides to tell his story anyway and he talks of how he was once staying with an old friend of his seemingly on the run or maybe hiding from his enemies maybe political opponents or something yeah definitely implies there's some kind of political violence yeah some dissident here. kind yeah, of exactly. character right yeah. staying in the guest room which was once occupied by the old family patriarch seems like he's the father of his friend or something like that right or maybe even the grandfather and he's been long dead for a while but anyway he's in this room and he keeps hearing strange voices specifically there's a woman singing and some men talking and stuff and he doesn't know where these sounds are coming from but he starts walking around and listening and he kind of realizes well they seem to be coming from behind this giant armor thing and one day this servant comes into the room and he's like hey man can you help me move this giant wardrobe thing or whatever it is <laughs> and the servant sort of pales and he tells him of how the old master at once he, he was being unfaithful to his wife and he loved the nun from the neighboring convent. And this servant had helped him by cutting a door into the back of the cupboard of the armoire. And it leads right into the convent. So I guess we're talking about a very attached set of buildings here. Yeah. It's, I thought this was kind of strange. I mean, I, I would I'd definitely not expect a convent to be completely isolated, but not like directly attached to somebody's house. Yeah, I mean, it could be one of these enormous 19th century mansions that have like huge sprawling wings and things like that. Oh, yeah. Well, I definitely would imagine that it, it was, considering, yeah. but I just... It's an interesting it juxtaposition, it. yeah. <laughs> yeah. The whole thing is kind of odd to me. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. We'll get into some of that oddness when we get through the yeah. plot here. So, presumably, this hole goes straight into the woman's bedroom. <laughs> it's very convenient. I guess the master and his wife didn't sleep in the same bedroom at the time, I would imagine. <laughs> so the affair, though, uh, was apparently very short-lived, and the uh, poor nun soon died. So, so much for the hole in the armoire and all that playing. The teller of the tale manages to convince this Juan to help him reveal the door, and so he goes through the door and finds himself in the unoccupied bedroom of this woman who is apparently a mesmerist and she has lots of books on science and on specifically the science of mesmerism and the narrator finds this a very strange contrast because there's all kinds of feminine articles around the room too and knickknacks and knitting and stuff like that yeah. all the stuff that girls are usually involved with uh, but it's as if this was the room of a man of science. He creates a spy hole now so that he can just look in on the chamber and not have to go through the door. He, he takes advantage of this. He's hanging out with his host, but he's preoccupied. He's really fascinated by what he's discovered, which I don't really know what he's discovered anything yet, but he certainly enjoys spying. So he finds that she has mesmerized a man now who is searching for the person that she loves. Because some of the things that she's been saying, because she likes to pace around her room and talk to herself, and she's like, where has he gone? You know, it's been so long. Why hasn't he said anything? I will find out. And so she is using this mesmerized individual who is in a clairvoyant state to look for this person. And he is able to do so and finds him at, a, looks like a party on a ship or something. And there's a dance going on. And he is dancing with another woman. And that is the paramour lost love of this mysterious lady is dancing with a woman. And she gets her medium Samuel to read his mind. And yeah, he's in love with the other girl. Our poor lady has been abandoned. So it's here that the title of the story is invoked and uttered in sorrow by this person. And it's also, I think, around now that the, the person telling the tale realizes that through observing this lady and her 
sorrows, and sadness, he has fallen in love with her too. And the story is not continued because our man hears a train whistle and realizes he must be away. <laughs> and he doesn't finish the tale. And the woman is left wondering forever what that was all about. And so am I. Yeah. The conf yeah. And we learn that a little postscript that he's been involved in many political revolutions all over South America and Europe. Escaping from prison and all these dashing getaways. Yeah. Yeah. The vague nature of this story, the lack of resolution on really anything, is brought up by the Rachel Ferreira book. And she says that Pablo Brescia has identified no fewer than eight narrative sequences and 13 storylines in the tale. But though many narrative frames are open, few are closed. Oh, so, yeah, I, can't, I didn't count them. I mean, I read that part too, and I'm like, is there that many? Are there that many? I yeah, yeah. I, I guess if you, you look at it and you see all the individual threads that are kind of woven through this very brief yeah, tale, I guess so. um, it, it could get that high. And I could see the vagueness and the constant shifting between narrations to be frustrating, but I really liked how the, I guess, ambiguity of the tale gave it this really weird atmosphere and vibe even though not too much was resolved yeah i mean i can see that i don't know to me i mean i can i can i guess with i see where they're getting at with all the multiple threads but to me it almost just seems like i mean don't get me wrong goriti seems like a really interesting person with a, a fascinating life and yeah. very progressive in her yeah. way but it almost seems childish to me like just the way all these things are introduced and just left hanging. Like it reminds yeah. me of stories that kids write where they're like <laughs> introduce this and this and this. Yeah. And then, then they just, nobody knows how to tie it up. So it's all just, I mean, I realize she's doing it on purpose, but right. I don't really know why. So I just kind of feel like, I don't know. I just, I it, wasn't It does feel like she's it. setting up for like a 250 page novel rather than a, <laughs> a five page yeah. short story here. And that's kind of why I would, I mean, I would, come away with this thinking that I wouldn't read one of her novels. Just oh, yeah, see... and it looks like she wrote mostly, or at least some, gothic fiction rather than this somewhat sci-fi adjacent stuff and the mesmeristic, clairvoyant angle. Well, I would say this is in line with gothic fiction. For yeah, sure. absolutely, yeah. 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 And, I mean, we talked about before how, how those lines blur, and we will be talking about some gothic stuff, and we have been, so it makes sense. Like, it is adjacent, and it makes sense. There is a certain depiction of the science of the time here and stuff. And But, I mean, just from a story sense and a, a narrative sense, I just didn't, I don't know, I didn't really connect with her to the, these two stories that much. Yeah, it's kind uh, of all across the board, this one. Yeah, I mean, if the greatest sense that I get after reading them and after reading about her is that, well, this sounds like an interesting milieu, and it sounds like an interesting, like, place that she was in, in all her travels and all her thoughts about improving women's lot and stuff like that that i would read a longer work and maybe be more satisfied with it so yeah. that's cool i mean i don't think that's for us to do in the podcast but i'd no, probably that not. i would consider doing yeah. yeah um so how do you think how do you think this story is subversive then so uh, one thing that ferrera talks about is that the mysterious mesmeric woman is operating in a typically male dominated sphere in that she's very yeah. well read in, I guess, what we consider actual science, but also uses this, what Ferrer calls an alternative science, what she calls, quote, the science whose power men without faith deny to gain knowledge that is physically and socially inaccessible to her. So she's really, I guess, in an opposite of what Doyle does in Parasite, which we'll get to later. She uses the female mesmeric character as a way of subverting the traditional male role in a scientific world in a similar fashion to what I think Cavendish was trying to do in the blazing world, although from a completely different angle there. But it strikes me as kind of the same approach. Yeah, I can see that. And Pereira also brought up this idea that it's a reversal of the beginning of the story where the woman who loved the old patriarch was abandoned by him right and now a couple of generations later the situation has been sort of turned on its head a little bit i guess but i don't really like i didn't really get the sense of that because i didn't really feel that there was any justifiable reason for him to be in love with this woman he was spying on 
Right. I mean, maybe it was like, just like a quick infatuation or, or something like that. But yeah, I guess so. Like, I, if anything, it would have been just like the first time. Right. So right. maybe maybe it's accurate, more accurate to say, well, she got away, like she got away from him. But but in a way, what well, she didn't though, because she was also the victim of love. Yeah. So in the end, I guess it's just sorrow for everybody. But he seems <laughs> right. to be like, yeah. I mean, years have gone by, and he's all involved in his politics and. Like, I don't know, physical action, maybe like actually, you know, being involved in civil wars and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, like, it doesn't seem like the whole love thing really consumed him to the point of death or anything like that. No, no, not at uh, all. So, I don't know. Yeah, I guess I can see why. Why I, I'm just surprised that apparently a lot has been written about this story, like the unresolvedness of it and the fact that what's been said about it doesn't really altogether seem to add up to a whole to me just yeah, yeah. i don't know yeah. yeah ferrera goes into this one in quite detail but she doesn't mention really anything about herbs and pins at all aside from just mentioning that no so it. why don't we talk about that one then That one's from 1876, so it's a little bit later. Um, this one also is about a doctor. <laughs> uh, he's also a mesmerist. Mm -hmm. It just seems to have been uh, something that medical men do at that time. Sometimes you're in luck if your physician is also a mesmerist, yeah. right? <laughs> so there's lots they can do and <laughs> alleviate your pain and so on. This mesmerist is famous in a certain town, and he's visiting a woman whom he perfunctorily mesmerizes and i thought that was kind of interesting like it was almost like he's he's been doing this for so long and so much that he's kind of bored of it at this point mm -hmm. like it's a very kind of of all the descriptions of mesmerism this episode like it's the most yeah yeah so then i did this and uh oh i almost forgot this part but uh, like right. it's kind of very casual <laughs> the supernatural kind of becomes the mundane <laughs> yeah yeah so the woman's i guess her trouble is she's worried about this santiago whom she loves and her friend Lorenza has been hanging out by his bedside looking after him and he's been sick for a, for a really long time unable to move and experiencing a plethora of inexplicable symptoms and when she mentions the name of his friend she does it in this kind of perplexed frightened way and I think she even goes into a convulsion at one point so there's obviously some unresolved psychological hang Absolutely. up there yeah 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 and when she's awake she doesn't remember this at all she's like oh lorenzo she's my favorite person i love her right <laughs> and it's easy for the doctor to figure out what's going on actually he kind of draws this conclusion before having even met anybody and he's like oh they're both in love with this santiago it's obvious i think at this point it was it was a, a bit after i read the story that i made notes for this but i think at this point she convinces him to visit Santiago. Yeah, he agrees to help Santiago. Yeah, he agrees to help because yeah. because he's a doctor, I guess, and that's his job. So it's while he's there and hanging out, and, and he's like, I guess, presumably examining the patient and striking his bedding and stuff. And he finds an effigy stuffed into the bedding somewhere, and it's a little doll with pins in it. Well, we students of fake voodoo and stuff all know what that means. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and he takes it home, and his wife, he doesn't recognize it. He doesn't know anything about it. Presumably, this is just not something, like, he hasn't read any stories or, or been to any mysterious indigenous ceremonies, so he doesn't know any of this. But his wife seems to get some kind of feeling from it, and she's like, well, maybe we should take the pins out. It must be in pain. Right. <laughs> and so he lets her do this, or maybe he does it himself. And the next day, he gets called to Santiago's house, and they think Santiago's dead, but he's just in a really, really deep sleep, from which he recovers after 12 hours, and he's in great shape, and the doctor administers him to him with certain herbs that he got from his friend, and the, that right. really Right, this is right around the same time that they discover the doll with pins in it, he's administered the herbs. So the removal of the pins and the administering 
of the tinctures yeah. happen more or less simultaneously. I didn't find the herbs part to be that significant. Like it didn't really, I don't know, it was just some random person gave him these plants to use. Yeah, a, a botanist. Yeah, it was a botanist friend of his. Yeah. I mean, it, like I'm not saying it doesn't work, but I just, there wasn't really a connection between the two I, that I could see other than perhaps, I'm not sure. I mean, the story doesn't mention the indigenous people at all. But, I mean, I'm wondering if she's kind of saying, like, well, these are things that the indigenous people know about? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it kind of wraps up with the narrator and the doctor saying, well, what do you think happened here? And it briefly, but I think effectively, highlights the difference in thought between what we consider traditional science and learned medicine versus folkloric superstition. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I did like this one better. It certainly wraps up its plot threads more than right. the other one. It did remind me of a lot of later stuff, and, and I kind of felt like it was not particularly... Didn't quite go as far with it as later stories do, and I mean, yeah. I guess that's that's not really criticism, because like, that's literally the way it has to work sometimes. Yeah, of course. It is still also very undeveloped. I mean, it's even shorter than the other story, yep. and it sort of frustrates me that you never find out why Lorenza curses this person if yeah. she cares about him so much. <laughs> right. It could be jealousy and possessiveness and whole sorts of other things, but... It yeah. seems like the doctor didn't really have any interest in inserting himself into this love triangle. I guess so, yeah. I mean, and it says Laura and Santiago marry a year later. Yeah, right. So, I mean, obviously, we know which one he was really interested in, I guess. Right. And I guess Lorenz is in the background seething. Right. I guess, I don't know, like, what was she doing to him to sort of try and push him in her direction? I guess yeah. looking, at, looking after him kind of thing. I yeah, guess. Right. But, uh, right. Yeah, Making him independent or something like that. So it reminded me a little bit of, I don't know if you've ever read Robert Bloch's story, uh, Speech to the Sweet. I don't believe so, no. No, okay. I, it's Robert Bloch is, he kind of got his start with like weird tales and all that, but yeah, most famously he's known as the writer of Psycho right, and right. Uh, a lot of other stuff. And he wrote this story and it's it was adapted by Amicus in one of the portmanteau films. I okay. think it was, I'm trying to remember which one it was. It might have been The House of Drip Blood. It's about this girl who's sort of, she's... She's the daughter of a witch, uh, well, somebody who turns out to be a witch, and a very stern, sort of aloof, harsh father figure, and the mother dies, and so he has to look after this kid, and the kid is, like, not liking the way her father is treating her, and not liking the fact that she gets dragged to church, and all this other stuff, sure. so she ends up, like, creating a effigy of him, and doing the whole stick the pins in kind right, of thing, and right. making him very ill, and the story has a nasty twist ending that I won't spoil because we're definitely not talking about that story. Yeah, but right. <laughs> like, it's just, yeah, it's really good. And it's a really good thing written over 100 years later that, or maybe about 100 years later, I don't know. This is 40s probably. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. has a, a similar kind of theme. And it's a really good story. So, yeah. Yeah, the only thing I've read by Block was his Jack the Ripper story that's in Dark Descent. Oh, yours truly, Jack the Ripper. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he's, maybe we'll cover him at some point, because he did write a lot of science fiction stories, too, actually. Yeah, yep, so we'll see. Uh, that one's one of Stephen King's favorite horror stories. Yeah. That I happen to know that, because it's in a compilation of, oh, I can't remember the name of the anthology, but it's a really good anthology where various horror writers put in their favorite horror stories. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. It's interesting for the fact that you get to see what stories they really like. Yeah. And, uh, so, yeah. So I guess before we close up on the Garidi, just some two words on where you can find these two stories. Herbs and Pins was an amateur fan translation done by Nina Zumel on her WordPress website, multoghost.wordpress.com. And the other one, He Who Listens, I could not find the provenance of the translation. The translation we read came from some world literature website and huh. they had a whole bunch of short stories from argentina and i tried to find out where the translation came from it appeared in a latin american anthology that was put out by oxford but again i wasn't able to discern anything yeah so that one can be found online as well but the who did the translation and when i'm not entirely sure of it's funny because the, the translation is full of meticulous notes yes that... it is don't yeah. necessarily connect that much to the story and are kind of obvious sometimes. Yeah. So it's like somebody put some work into it, maybe an excessive, slightly 
wrong direction kind of amount of work. <laughs> right. I don't know. It's just, yeah. but yeah, it's it's cool. So that was Goriti. And yeah, I'm sorry I didn't really enjoy these more, but they were short, so they weren't painful or anything to read. Yeah, very short, even shorter than the post. So again, 15 minute reads for both of them at most. Yeah. So we're now going to turn to Britain now, and we're going to discuss a very famous writer, but somebody who's perhaps more famous for what they created and maybe just a small corner of their entire work and what they were really all about. We're going to talk about a Scotsman named Arthur Conan Doyle. Let me try to reason it out. This woman, by her own explanation, can dominate my nervous organism. She can project herself into my body and take command of it. She has a parasite soul. Yes, she is a parasite, a monstrous parasite. She creeps into my frame as the hermit crab does into the whelk's shell. I am powerless. What can I do? I am dealing with forces of which I know nothing, and I can tell no one of my trouble. They would set me down as a madman. Certainly, if it got noticed abroad, the university would say that they had no need of a devil-ridden professor. And Agatha? No. No, I must face it alone. Arthur Ignatius Doyle, a name that is well known to, I suspect, nearly everyone who's listening, and millions more, but perhaps not for the reasons that Arthur Conan Doyle, a Scotsman born in Edinburgh in 1859, would like. He was the second of ten children, eight of whom were girls. His father was a drunken Irishman, a surveyor by trade. He was indeed a heavy abuser of alcohol, and it got so bad that he pretty much lost his job and ended up having a stroke, and then supposedly pretty much went insane, and he ended up spending much of his life after Doyle was a teen in a lunatic asylum. Now, Arthur Conan Doyle had a very interesting life, mixed with a lot of people went on some quite fascinating adventures and there's really too much to get into here entirely yeah but we don't have to because as it turns out we'll be hanging around with doyle quite a bit in these early days of chrononauts and he in fact is more tied in to our subject matter than i think most people including perhaps ourselves yeah realized yeah, we're going to come back to him in a way in our next episode, but not through one of his stories, but rather through one of his nonfiction works. Not directly, but we may talk about him still. Yeah. Now, Arthur was packed off to a Jesuit boarding school at age nine, and he only saw his family during the summertime after that point till he graduated in his late teens. And it was a hard life. It was full of really bad food and corporal punishment, basically. He decided, though, to study medicine and attend the University of Edinburgh. He got a scholarship, but there was some mix up there, and things didn't quite work out the way they were intended, but he ended up going to school anyway. He was taught by a, a Joseph Bell, who is believed to have been the inspiration for his famous Sherlock Holmes character. And indeed, that is how most people will know Arthur Conan Doyle. We're not here to talk about Sherlock Holmes, and in fact... We of Chrononauts may never talk about Sherlock Holmes, so sorry. <laughs> he did try his hand at writing occasionally at this time in his college days. He made his first sale at age 19. He was heavily influenced by Poe, 
and other writers, including other American writers like Fenimore Cooper. He was a very large, burly man. He was fond of sports like cricket and boxing. When he was about 21, he was asked to join a whaling expedition by a friend, and they went to the Arctic. And it was there that Doyle says he became a man while he was on a ship with a whole bunch of sailors, most of whom were more experienced than him. And this is where he came of age. It was, by all accounts, a very interesting experience, which Conan Doyle, as he liked to be known, wrote about. And we're fortunate, I guess, in the sense that, sort of like H.G. Wells, Conan Doyle seems to have been a person to document a lot of things and have a lot to talk about and always be writing something. In fact, he seems like he was a busy man in general. He was, once he came back from this expedition with a little bit of money, because it was a they, had, they didn't do so well at the whaling and sealing, which they also did. But he came back with enough money in his pocket to, well, his mother at this point was, was pretty much a single woman. And he was certainly very interested in trying to support the family. Now, many of his sisters were working abroad. Three of his sisters actually lived in Portugal and they would send money to the family. Conan Doyle wanted to obviously have a hand in this too and he was devoted to his mother through much of his life and would often ask for her opinion and approval of things that he decided in his life. He continued to write at this point. He wrote a lot of sea stories. Herman Melville was another big influence. So it seems like the American authors of the time were, were actually one of his major influences, which is kind of interesting because it's kind of working now the reverse of a way things may have sort of started, whereas this sort of the European old world colonizers and travelers are taking influence from the new world. Right. Doyle wore many hats. He was a medical practitioner for a very long time. He also enjoyed making caricature drawings. His grandfather was a caricaturist and quite a well-known famous one, in fact, in his day. So Arthur liked to draw sketches and some of them were quite humorous. When he graduated from medical school, there's a sketch that exists, and it's a sketch, a self-portrait of him sort of standing there holding his diploma in the air, and there's a caption on it, it says, License to Kill. <laughs> in 1881, he was offered a position on board a steamer to Africa, so there he engaged on an African adventure, 12 pounds a month he made, and of course, you know, he sent this money home because his family desperately needed this. He spent three months on that steamer, the Mayomba, and he, that was enough to demonstrate to him that this wasn't really the kind of job for him. He had some interesting adventures, to be sure, but he didn't enjoy the climate, and certain other aspects of the journey did not please him. The ship was in very terrible shape and apparently almost blew up several times <laughs> and nearly crashed into a reef as well, so... Quite an adventurous time he had. Yeah, I would say. He didn't speak ill of the people, though. In fact, for his time, he was probably one of the less racist British travelers of note. Although I did read one sea story when I was a lot younger that kind of played on the whole racial outsider angle. Like, main character was called a half-breed several times, and it was a little bit, it was a little bit weird. But he did seem to be kind of a somewhat socially conscious person. He also again, like Wells, essentially denied his Catholic upbringing. His mother was very religious, and a lot of his family got invited to stay with his relatives in London, and they were an elegant, well-to-do aunt and uncle of his. And the idea was that he was going to start a medical practice. They had this idea that he was going to be catering to all their wealthy friends and socialites and stuff, and Doyle, at this point, admitted to his uncle that he was an agnostic, and it didn't go well. <laughs> he, again, like Wells, was really interested in the work of T.H. Huxley and his lectures, and he decided he didn't have much time for Catholicism anymore. But he did have time for other things, like a budding interest in mesmerism and spiritualism that would come soon enough. He had many adventures on the way to starting his practice. He fell in with a con man for a while, like one of these quack doctor types, and it was very, uh, and he barely managed to extricate himself from that. But he finally managed to set up a practice. During this time, while he was trying to build things up, he was also working out his way of doing things. And that because it was very difficult to get patients, 
he would walk around the new town he lived in and just observe everything and get to know people and he would just talk to everyone and i think this is kind of an important part of his personality because he seems to be a very observant person and what he's known for is the character of sherlock holmes yeah, who's right. this ultra rational exactly. so observant that it's kind of insane and unbelievable but supposedly these traits also of observation were ones that his teacher joseph bell expressed and so when asked he would say that oh this detective is based on a real person that i actually knew who would make such outlandish but true observations right, yeah <laughs> in 1885 he married his first wife louisa louisa hawkins and he officially obtained his doctorate and his literary output increased at this time and he started to attempt to write novels thought it was very significant to have one's name on a volume so he really wanted that because uh, obviously beforehand he had been writing stories published in magazines and such and some of the novels would originally be serialized but he wanted to have them published in, in individual volumes sherlock holmes finally emerged in 1886 with a study in scarlet but not quite as conan doyle wanted it ended up first being published in an annual along with a whole bunch of other stuff but it did end up getting a second edition and it didn't do too badly in contrast to some of the other books that he was writing around this time which were received in a somewhat lukewarm fashion among them was michael clark which is somewhat known but much lesser known book that i just learned about that i might want to come back to later called the mystery of Clumer, which incorporates many strange supernatural happenings and is something of a gothic novel and it has elements of esp and mind transference and mesmerism and all kinds of stuff supposedly now almost every chapter some weird thing is introduced so this is early on in doyle's literary output but it seems that these things were already very much on his mind and what's important to note is they would only continue to be so more and more the older doyle became he attended the demonstration of Professor Milo de Meyer's mesmeric research in 1889, and the performance appeared as a kind of absurd act uh, of volunteers being hypnotized and forced to perform bizarre actions. So again, we have a recurring theme here. This thing has been around for a long time, this uh, sort of almost vaudeville hypnotism act yeah great spectacle indeed at this demonstration he volunteered to allow himself to be mesmerized but de Meyer said that he wasn't suggestible enough so that was a failure <laughs> <laughs> right definitely doyle was consumed by this idea of mesmerism and what it could do and the spiritual interests started to really take root and he would perform experiments with many of his friends in things like telepathy and so on. Now, this is really interesting to me because, again, it's really something that fascinates me now after reading a little bit more, more about him. I've known for a few years that this was something that Doyle was interested in. I mean, I remember reading the Sherlock Holmes stories when I was a kid, and I, I read a lot of them, I would say maybe about half the short stories and two of the novels so there's still quite a bit more that i haven't read and that i would like to come back to because i do enjoy those stories despite the somewhat dismissive a tone i adopted earlier uh it was just for the <laughs> dramatic purposes yeah i've only read the hound of the baskervilles so I'm, yeah I, and that's a really good one yeah but I, I i read about this somewhere else that he had this interest in spiritualism and i always assumed that it was a hobby and i thought oh, okay so it's just something he thought was cool and something he was interested in but no it, it in fact it was much deeper than that this was a, a near obsession for him and at the end of his life almost a crusade yeah conan doyle was somebody who adopted these kind of crusades he was very into championing various things and the spiritualism stuff even though it was very popular at the time it seems like people had a hard time reconciling it with him and with his what they thought they knew about him and what they thought of his great detective character who at the time was i mean now especially but even back then was much more heralded than anything else that he did oh by far yeah yeah this rankled him uh, 
I mean, I guess he was fond of the home stories himself, but he considered them lightweight entertainments, basically. And it's very odd because, I mean, when you read the home stories, they do seem so rational and they seem so like nothing supernatural could happen here. There's a lot of things that might seem that way, but usually by the end, uh, as in The Hound of the Baskervilles, yeah, they're revealed right. to be you right. know, some completely natural phenomenon that can be explained away by known physical phenomena. Right. In a sense, it's kind of reminiscent of Poe's Murders in the Rue Morgue or something like that. Yeah, that too. And Dupin, Poe's detective, was, was a big influence on Doyle. Yeah, absolutely. But Doyle, Conan Doyle has a very different writing style, and Conan Doyle prided himself on his writing style, which was, he said anyway, meant to be very clear and not obtuse. So it's essentially a simple writing style that he was you know, sort of proud of having. And I think I know it would seem to be true. I mean, not just judging by this story, but everything else I've read, I would say that uh, like people who are put off by 19th century prose, of which there are a surprising many nowadays, yes, would yeah. find him an easy read. Yeah, he's very direct, especially here. Yeah, definitely. So this, this contradictory dichotomy is something that was fascinating to me anyway. And obviously to many other people. And it, it perhaps explains the fact that Sherlock Holmes has eclipsed the man himself and all his other works. He really was proud of his historical novels, which he began writing with Micah Clark. And there were many others, specifically the, what was it, Sir Nigel and the White Company. Those were the type of books that he considered to be his best works. And he said he was very influenced by Walter Scott and... He wanted to convey 14th century chivalry and stuff like that. And these were the books that he wanted to be known for. And later on, his spiritualist cause, which he said everything else in his writing career and in his life was leading up to. So he believed that that was the ultimate end to which everything that he'd done up to that point right, yeah. was intended for. He was seen at the time as being somebody who was rather credulous. And perhaps this also hurt his reputation somewhat, as he did witness many medium demonstrations and also visit haunted houses and things like that and participate in various experiments. He documented everything, but he had this way of omitting really vital pieces of information that would either prove or disprove the things he was saying. So, for example, he would talk about how he and various other people were sitting around and how this happened, various things happen, but he would sort of fail to talk about everyone else in the room and what their stakes might be in the situation or what they might, like, he, he left out important pieces of information that perhaps took away from the reliability of his work in the eyes of some. And some people thought he was not quite of sound mind when it came to these particular subject matters. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's interesting because, I mean, it just shows, I guess, that by the late 1800s, perhaps, there was a bit less favor towards this Absolutely, kind of thing. yeah. The sources note that mesmerism in general kind of falls, I wouldn't say out of favor, but certainly declines in popularity after 1850. And this is 1894, Parasite was written, so we're talking about almost 50 years later. Yeah, but it's not like this stuff was exactly passe because it was being taken aloft by a stranger and stranger individuals. Yeah, right. Madame Blavatsky was somebody yeah, exactly. that Conan Doyle was very interested in. Yeah. In 1893, he joined the Society for Psychical Research, which has come up before. They received a paper on the fourth dimension. As you recall, may have been mentioned in the time travel episode. I'm not sure if I mentioned it specifically or not, but that happened. His membership was approved by Arthur Balfour, who was then a conservative MP and would become prime minister later. Other members of the society at that time included physicist Oliver Lodge, Alfred Russell Wallace, the famous naturalist, and the chemist William Crookes. And he was already a member of a Masonic Lodge at this time as well. So we're going to stop talking about Doyle at this time, even though he lives for another over 35 years, and go to the story that he wrote in 1894, around this time, called The Parasite. And the excerpt that you heard at the beginning of this segment was indeed from that story. Here we have a balls out, unadulterated, completely modern horror story. 
Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. So this story was written in 1894. It has a possible precedent. Doyle wrote a similar story in 1889, actually, called John Barrington Cowles. John Barrington Cowles. And it's another story of a sort of femme fatale mesmerist. This one, though, is a little longer, I think, and could be considered a novella, I suppose. It's kind of on the border of, like, short story novella length. It's like 15,000-ish words. Yeah. So that gray area. So another precedent just around this time, a bit of a funny story. He was called by his friend, James Barry, who was a playwright and most famous nowadays as the writer of Peter Pan. But he was working on a libretto for an operetta at the Savoy. And this was supposed to be basically a space filler because they were doing Gilbert and Sullivan operettas. And Gilbert and Sullivan had one of their many frequent spats and so refused to work together for a while and they needed something to fill the time they needed a comic operetta basically so barry had started work on this thing called jane annie but he was unable to finish it because he had a nervous breakdown so he called on his friend arthur who was a fellow student and they collaborated on this work and it was about a female mesmerist and there's all this case of comic mistaken identity and stuff like that. And she manages to get away from her chaperones and get up to all kinds of mischief. The play was not well received. Nobody liked it and didn't go over well. And Barry got into some trouble over various things. It's interesting because Doyle uh, knew both Barry and Oscar Wilde, who ended up being gay men in the late 19th century who got into a lot of trouble because of yep. their sexuality. Right. Conan Doyle himself seems to have been heterosexual, but seemed to express sympathy for homosexuality, but he didn't go far enough to outright embrace it. Like he thought it was something that could be treated in a hospital and shouldn't be criminalized. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's progress. But this story concerns a professor Gilroy of physiology, and he's writing his diary. And he starts out by griping that he doesn't want to attend a dinner party. And it's this party of his friend, Wilson, who's a psychologist. And uh, although they're supposed to be friends, Gilroy does nothing but complain about him. So I don't know. But I guess when he's not inviting him to uncomfortable dinner parties, he must be a pretty cool guy. So it's kind of a funny reversal that happens here because the psychologist, Wilson, he's described by Gilroy as somebody who likes these new mystical soft sciences. But Gilroy, who is this person who prides himself on, on his cold, rational, scientific mind, admits that he is also unstable in some ways and a very nervous person and kind of a little soft in the head, unlike the psychologist who seems to be very easygoing and quite quite a strong individual not soft at all in fact and Gilroy seems to resent this because he knows that he should be the other way and he probably thinks that things are backwards from the way they should be and maybe right. that's one of the reasons he resents Wilson so much yeah Gilroy's engaged to Agatha not Clara but Agatha <laughs> whose family is I guess they're friends with the Wilsons or something so they all hang out together they're all associated with the university that Gilroy and Wilson are at. Now, Wilson has made the acquaintance of a medium named Miss Helena Penclosa. She is a Trinidadian woman, and she is described in rather unflattering detail. She's described, like, in various terms as sallow. She's a cripple. She's got a bad leg. It's not a nice description. <laughs> no, and that really carries over into her personality as we're going to see yeah. shortly yeah and he describes her in, in various times as cat-like and not in a good way like more of a predatory way so she's obviously a femme fatale of the highest order she tries to demonstrate in their first meeting her powers but mr gilroy easily explains away all her demonstrations yeah he's not impressed one bit no he's not impressed and he, he kind of makes he makes some solid points about what you're supposed to do in company and like whether it's the polite thing to to <laughs> yeah. to tell somebody that they're full of shit yeah, or right. whether you just sort of play along <laughs> yeah and exactly kind of goes back to what i was saying in the sure. very beginning beginning of the presentation right? yeah and this is all presented as like a dinner party parlor trick yeah 
Yeah. So I think it's it might be at their second meeting, but Penclosa asks Gilroy to point out the woman there of most sound mind. So of course he picks Agatha. Penclosa looks significantly at her and it, he knows that they've been talking about him. But she places Agatha in a trance during which this frail seeming woman appears to grow suddenly more vigorous and stronger and she whispers a bunch of things in Agatha's ear that he doesn't hear and then wakes her up and he spends the rest of the evening uneasy and he leaves early accompanied by his girlfriend presumably he's taking her home I guess we're in that kind of setting so. yeah Pancosa puts a note in his hand though before they leave and tells him to read it at 10 the next morning surprisingly he agrees to do this or at least doesn't deny that he will do it Maybe he himself is engaged in his own kind of private test. At 9.30, the next morning, Agatha shows up, and she's in a very weird state, and she says their engagement's over. And she keeps repeating variations of the same phrase over and over again, no matter what he says. So it's very eerie. There's obviously something wrong with her. She's like one of those stereotypical hypnotized people in a movie or TV show, and you like try to talk to them, and they just say, Yes, master, what is your will? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so she walks out, and he's very distraught, obviously. But he remembers, again, surprisingly, perhaps, at 10, that he has to read this note. So he does it and learns that Penkosa planted these suggestions in his fiance's head and that she should be all right now and he should go to her. So he does, and Agatha doesn't seem to remember anything. She doesn't remember them meeting, let alone what was said to her in the trance state. Well, Gilroy is kind of convinced, or starting to be convinced, and now there's the coup de grace. So he starts to reason things out, and he believes that, okay, spirit is the product of matter. Uh, now he's thinking maybe the body is just the instrument. He certainly wants to pursue the issue further, yeah. Yeah, and he starts talking to Helena Penclosa about all this, and she explains her powers, and she talks about how she can completely command a subject without prior suggestion, possibly without their knowledge. The key is not strength of will, but the ability to project or detach that will. The projector has to maintain some small connection with the body, or else it can be hard to find the way back. So Gilroy agrees to allow himself to be mesmerized, and he goes into a trance. And it's like being underwater. He's sinking fast. And then he hears the medium's voice commanding him to awake. He thinks about an hour has passed. He doesn't really have any idea what went on, but he feels good and wants to continue the experiment. So the next day in his diary, he calls a blank day, an indication of how much this is starting to mean to him, because he can't seem to think of anything else. It's very suspicious. The next day is mesmerized, and the trance comes on more quickly, and he starts noting the physical measurements of the environment, like a scientist, before submergence. And he meets his neighbor, Charles Sattler, who's some kind of anatomical specialist. And he hears about, this Sattler hears about Gilroy's rendezvous with Penclosa and advises him to have nothing more to do with her. It's like he has had some terrible experience himself. It's starting to remind me of Rappuccini's daughter at this point. Yeah, though the character of Penclosa is a lot more sinister then. Yeah, she's much more sinister, but just the fact that he's being warned away by this, like, kind of friend of his sure. and he's like this this will only lead to bad things yeah and, uh, yeah. yeah i mean i guess that's common sort of femme fatale sort of trope too in its own way but i mean i didn't like in the hawthorne that she she wasn't menacing in her own right she was a completely innocent character yeah yeah so it was interesting as it, it was almost ahead of its time yeah respect. for sure but but he can't really explain he just has to be a subject of these experiments he starts to note a possible deleterious effect, though, on his constitution. He's seeming nervous and ill at ease, and his fiance doesn't want him to be involved in this anymore. And he says, must continue science! So the next day, he says, well, I think the woman, Penclosa, has some kind of attachment to me. And he thinks that maybe she's falling for him. But, but, 
soon. It's he who is reaching for her hand. Waking from the mesmeric sleep, he feels nearly compelled to say what she expects him to say. So this is getting way too much for him, and he runs from the room, not knowing what could happen next, but dreading, remembering his precious Agatha. Yeah, I think it's around here where he compares his relationship with Penclosa to being in the throes of an opium addiction. You know, he knows it's poor for him. He knows it's taking an extreme toll on his health, but he just can't stop. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, Conan Doyle himself, you know, he didn't believe that stories needed to be autobiographical anyway. But, I mean, there are some things here that, that kind of set off some triggers. Yeah. For example, his wife became terminally ill. Can't recall offhand what was wrong with her. And it's not something that I wrote down because it didn't, it wasn't really relevant to right. uh, what we're doing here. But essentially, though... Conan Doyle had to be celibate at this point, supposedly. Yeah, yeah, right. So they had no sexual relations, and who knows whether he got them elsewhere. I mean, it's entirely possible, but he certainly wouldn't have been open about it. No, no. Conan Doyle, he seems like an open-minded person in a lot of ways, but he also had a pretty conservative moral streak, definitely. Yeah. So uh, things like adultery made him very uncomfortable. He even withheld some of the Sherlock Holmes stories that he wrote afterwards because he realized that they dealt with those subjects he wasn't sure if he he thought maybe they were too sensational for people they were published after the fact of course but because sherlock holmes was so amazingly popular yeah it's a huge money-making franchise right but it just shows that that it, like doyle himself maybe had more important considerations to sure. himself yeah uh, i guess he was making enough money at this point anyway yeah, I'd imagine the profits from the Holmes series would yeah. keep him afloat for pretty right. much this entire period of his life. And it is also supposed that he may have had some addiction issues because as a, a physician in the late 1800s, he wasn't above or beyond experimenting on himself with various sure. new, new drugs. Yeah, And cocaine was pretty popular at that time. And Sherlock Holmes most famously enjoyed Solution that he concocted himself that he would inject <laughs> into his veins. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Watson in the home stories is very condemnatory of this practice. In fact, maybe a little bit more so than people would have been on average at that time, which is something that a lot of people don't understand. Mm -hmm. It's like people think, oh, Holmes and his cocaine habit. And then like, they think it's just normal that Watson is sort of censorious. But actually at that time, it was considered a medicine. Right, freely available at drug stores, same with morphine and other opioids at the time. Yeah, definitely. So at this time, Gilroy is definitely very addicted to the things that are happening to him. He tries to call off the experiments, but he sends her a note and says he wants to call it off. But that very day, he starts to have feelings of such abject worthlessness and horribleness and depression that he goes to visit her anyway. And she just asks, like, she never got the note and everything is normal. And it just gets worse and worse. By the time he's holding, he knows that he's been holding her hand and he's been talking intimately with her and they've been talking about Agatha and, like, it's not good. A very dismissing his fiancée in favor of this woman. And he writes that he'll never sit with her again, but, of course, he can't keep the resolve. He tries to lock himself in his room. And it's a very amusing thing that he does. He, he throws the key out so he can't get to it. And then in the morning, he has to call one of the servants to get the key from the garden. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, it's not it's not quite known why he couldn't do that in the mesmeric state. Like, it's sort of a convenience of the story, I guess, because yeah. it just seems like sometimes the rules are being made up as they go along. Kind of yeah, thing. I mean, I guess the implication is that he has no free will other than what Penclosa yeah. is yeah. doing to him. And I guess it's not something... Penclosa could have anticipated. In his lucid moments, he's realizing what's happened to him, but he's fallen under her spell completely. And he's kind of lightened by the knowledge that the horrible impulses don't come from himself, but they've been implanted in him. So kind of a burden off in a way. He goes to Sadler, but Sadler seems kind of nonplussed, and he kind of figures that, well, maybe she kind of tried to rope him in, but the mesmerism wasn't really a part of it. Maybe it was just sexual <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, that seems to be the implication. Anyway. Yeah, right. But obviously, you think now Penclosa must be thrilled because she's apparently found the perfect mesmeric subject. 
and the suggestion is she's she's looking for Englishmen to seduce and keep. And it's kind of funny here because Conan Doyle is clearly having some fun with this story because he locks himself in the room and he's like, he doesn't want to be hag-ridden. And so I just wrote in my notes, better bed-ridden than hag-ridden. Because <laughs> like, it seems to me what, what he's sort of getting at. He has various kind of terrors about her coming to get him and stuff. And he talks about like falling into the clutch of her crutch. <laughs> <laughs> nice alliteration yeah, there. Like, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he's having a, a good time with this stuff. He learns Penclose is ill all of a sudden, and uh, influence seems to be lessened, but it doesn't last. Meanwhile, he's been trying to make sure things are good with Agatha and told her that he doesn't want either of them to associate with Penclosa anymore. But when she gets better, her influence just seems stronger on him. And she starts making really weird things happen at this point it starts getting it, it almost turns into a contest like obviously she wants him seduced and she wants him at her mercy and stuff but it's not just that it's almost like in a way the two of them are becoming equals the more familiar they are with each other mm -hmm. so i mean again i think it's this idea that that it's the animal magnetism drawing them together and the fact that He's been mesmerized so many times now. The process happens when he joins her. It happens very quickly, whereas in the beginning, it took many passes. Yeah, very reluctant, yeah. Several minutes, right? But yeah. now it's almost instantaneous. And the reason that it's that way is that they are connected. So, in fact, that isn't always to her advantage. Sometimes that's something that I think you can see resonances of in a lot of more modern sort of horror stories and stuff where like yeah there's this connection established between two people it's not necessarily voluntary on both sides and yet rather than a merely parasitic relationship it's kind of like what affects one person affects the other so the person who's the victim could perhaps turn the tables if they sure, had the yeah. right knowledge one day though like he's playing cards with his friends and he's kind of pretended to forget about her i guess because she's been sick but she almost physically drags him out of the room, like right in the middle of their card game. And he's over at her place, and before he knows what's happening, he's talking of love and ardor and how much he wants her and, and holding her hands, because that's about the extent of the physical contact we get in this story. But it's still, the words described are certainly sensuous enough. But she soon weakens, and... It's at this point that he really lets loose on her, and he talks very aggressively to her, even, like, resorting to talking about physical violence. It's sort of extreme, but it's kind of funny because it's, like, it's sort of a re real, revealing a little bit of Doyle's character, is that he could occasionally be a little bit on the pugnacious side. Yeah, I'd say quite a bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, I don't think he actually beat women or anything, like, domestically, but I, I just think, like... The fact that he thinks this person is so horrible and they're so much of a user, he's like, it would be great for society if I beat you to death, <laughs> <Right>. basically. <laughs> like, it's probably one of the most extreme things we've seen, like, in all the episodes yet, in yeah. terms of just very direct, pointed, aggressive speech, right? And it's like, he's, he's like, I would do that. But he doesn't actually do it. He doesn't actually exhibit any violence. He just talks about it. He's very kind of satisfied in a way that she knows exactly what he thinks of her and even though he's still under her thrall at this point it's almost like he knows that at this point on it's really now become a game because she knows that she can't really have his soul and she never will no matter how much she is able to still manipulate him and and here we get something that's perhaps undermining of some of the principles of mesmerism we had expressed because many of the, the original practitioners and beyond state that you can't be forced to do things against yeah, your will. Right, right. I guess the suggestion here is that the, the process has been it's been going on for so long and he's so deeply under that his will can be subverted. But it's still a thing and maybe he has a fighting chance. But at this point, she starts to try and destroy his life, because what does she have to lose now, I guess? She says she'll rule him for fear, if not love, and that's what she decides to do. It starts out with him being at the university, 
and he's doing lectures and he finds himself being overtaken in the middle of his lectures and speaking a whole bunch of mad gibberish and basically becoming the laughing stock of the university. He himself, well, he gets his lecture status taken away. He can't he gets his lab taken away as well. She gets him to start engaging in criminal activity like bank robbing. Yeah. <laughs> which and he's very inefficient at it too so it's like yeah. he's essentially a complete beast merching of his character and like everything about him he's really messed up all the time now he's like constantly twitchy and on edge on the night of may the 4th his diary breaks off suddenly and suddenly his hands all swollen and this is because she decided that he was, in fact, going to engage in some physical violence. He's going to beat up his neighbor, Charles Sadler, because she figures out that, no, well, she decides anyway. He doesn't, Sadler doesn't really say much to Gilroy, but she's decided, oh, he must have poisoned him against me, I guess. He must have revealed the truth of whatever sordid affair they had. So she takes advantage of the man's strength and has him lay him out. And it doesn't stop there. One day he comes to, and he's in Agatha's room holding this. Uh, he has, well, he's not holding it. I think it's, he finds it in his clothes. There's this bottle of sulfuric acid. And he knows that the only thing that stopped him from throwing it in the face of his fiance was the fact that she wasn't in the room at the time. It's horrible. Yeah. <laughs> and he makes Agatha swear that she loves him and... It's very, uh, he's very emotional. At this point, he's free of the influence for now, and he wants to murder Penclosa. And he's ready to do it. All this time, by the way, she's been staying at his friend Wilson's place, I think. And this Wilson is not really present in the story. He doesn't really seem to do anything, just bring them together. Yeah. Again, their friendship seems sort of dubious to me. But anyway, he shows up at the house, and he learns that Penclosa has died and the story ends there very abruptly yeah very abrupt almost like a deus ex machina type ending where he's gonna inject agatha with a sulfuric acid but snaps out of it at the last second to realize that she's shuffled off on her own <laughs> yeah i mean i uh i don't know i i think the the abrupt ending was like i would have liked it to end a little differently like there's some Again, I was saying with the Poe, I think that's a perfect abrupt ending. Yeah. Uh, this one I would have liked to have seen a little more. Yeah, it doesn't like, quite work as well. And Doyle himself wasn't a big fan of this work. No, he tried to suppress it. Yeah, right. He disowned it and had it removed from the listings of his collected works. Yeah, it could be because of the sexual ramifications, and it could also be because maybe he thought it wasn't really all that good. Yeah, I mean, I did enjoy it, but the ending was pretty abrupt and I thought somewhat unsatisfying. And also it does have a rather nasty, misogynistic undercurrent to it. Yeah, a little bit. the little femme bit. fatale character, who is a very obvious evil woman character, but certainly yeah. far different than the way Greedy portrayed a female mesmerist. Right. Yeah, very much so. And I was satisfied by the story in general. I mean, I could see how things went the way they did and why they did yeah. towards the end. Like, yeah. I feel like, all right, so when it came to actually damaging his loved one, it was enough to sort of break the spell. Mm -hmm. And because they were connected and because his feelings were so violent, that's probably what killed him. The shock, yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah, and and I can see all that implied. I don't like to, the story to have ended with him actually discovering her body. I think that would have been right. cool. Right, yeah. And like... What I think would have been a cool ending was be if there's no servant to tell him anything, there's no, like, he doesn't arrive too late. And he arrives and he goes into the room and she's there dead with yeah. this horrible expression on her face. Right. That would have been a good way to end it. Yeah. I don't know why he didn't do that. He missed an opportunity there. Yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> but I think overall this was enjoyable. I mean, it was very quick and it pulls you in very much from the get-go. Yeah, it was a really fun story. Yeah. It was very, I guess I could say, like, not in a Steam Man of the Prairies way, but in a sort of perhaps more modern way. I thought it was very pulpy, like, yeah, absolutely. In, a cool, in a cool way. Yeah. You could tell that he had a good time, even if later on he kind of disowned it for various moral reasons, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And all the fun with alliteration and stuff like yeah. that. And the, the slightly humorous 
thing about him locking himself in his room so he won't go see her. Like, right. I mean, it could have been the most painful, like, heart-wrenching section. And in a way it was, but there was also, I think, a humorous undercurrent to it. Yeah, yeah. And it's also like, oh, this guy, like, he wants it so bad and he has to keep himself in his room. But it also had that kind of whole, like, the addict trying to break himself of his addiction kind sure, of thing going yeah. on, too. In a lot of these stories, the trance seem kind of delicate, like, don't break the circle, that kind of thing. Like, right. not, the, not the stories we're doing tonight, but, like, the in general accounts of mesmeric states and mediums and stuff. Yeah. But, but here it's pretty heavy. Like, Gilroy's invited to shout in Agatha's ear at one point and, like, grab her. And yeah, she won't wake up, stuff. yeah. And she won't wake up. Yeah, yeah, like nothing happens, and she's demonstrating the power of it. And indeed, this is something that's described in some of the primary sources that it can get that serious. And but I mean, somebody like Gregory says, "Well, you shouldn't do that because, like, that could show your nervous state of mind, and so right. your subject may not respond favorably to that, yeah, even exactly. if they don't wake up." Yeah, I thought the fact that the physiologist was like the non-rational person that was kind of interesting yeah too. it was like that it was something he envied the other guy for having and i wanted to see more of their relationship i actually i kind of flashed back to like when we were doing the time machine and i said i really like the like the whole dinner party setting yeah I like the whole way to introduce the story yeah, and yeah, its right. characters yeah but i don't think that doyle took as much advantage of that as he could have i could have been like had a discussion talking about Wilson and Gilroy and how they view the world rather mm -hmm. than actually having Gilroy tell us about it. Yeah. Like I can see how the diary format is sort of an effective one, but maybe not in all cases. I did think that even though it was uh, easy enough to get into, I think the beginning could have been handled in a more engaging way as well. Right. Yeah. Uh, certainly the character of uh, Wilson could have been expanded upon more. I would have liked more dialogue scenes to explain that rather than, mind you, I mean, that would have resulted probably in a longer book. Yeah. And maybe Doyle just didn't see the need to tell the story out that much. But right, right. It is the case where I, I could have seen the advantages of making it more so and making Penclosa a more nuanced character, perhaps. Yeah, she than... feels very one-dimensional in this. Yeah. Just kind of an evil woman who's power-tripping. Yeah, she's just really That's hungry really... and power-tripping. Yeah. 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 It, it is a little bit unfortunate because I kind of I could have been. I mean, there is a hint there. Of, of, of a sadness, right? And it's yeah, a sad absolutely. state for a person to be in. Right. And that's not like, it's more a revulsion that's exploited. Yeah, they don't, they don't really go into her, I guess, psychology or mental state or why she is the way she is. She just kind of is and has this almost innate quality to her. Yeah, the female character in John Barrington Cowles is similar in that she's a destroyer of men, yeah, essentially. Right, right. Written you know, five, five years earlier or so. Yeah. In the book Victorian Literary Mesmerism by Martin Willis and Catherine Wynne, they discuss this at length and say that the character of Penclosa kind of represents the fears in the medical sphere concerning female mediumship, which was you know, traditionally more of a male position. Yeah. So it's kind of the inverse of what Garidi was doing, whereas this is motivated by, I guess, a fear of women encroaching upon men's spaces, Garidi took it in another direction, being more empowering for women. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And that was interesting. In terms of atmosphere, this did remind me quite a bit of Robert Louis Stevenson's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Oh, Man. absolutely. Yeah, that's definitely a major influence on this, on the way that the character just kind of wakes up from this trance and has no idea what he's done, and he's in this state of disarray, just committing a bank robbery, just beat the crap out of somebody. And the two are very, very similar. Yeah. Yeah, that, and that was quite obvious, I guess. But yeah. definitely, I mean, it's not a ripoff. But yeah, it was mostly what you said, like the the whole waking up from this. I just remember this one part of the Stevenson story where Jekyll's like just sort of sitting there, I think outside in his, his garden or something like that. And like suddenly he feels something like a tremble in his hands. And he like wakes up suddenly and he realizes that during that time, he's been hide and some things have happened that yep. he doesn't really know about. Right. And it's, like, really creepy. The racial hierarchy angle is expressed in this story. Gilroy's actually, I think he's described as a black Irishman. There's a bit of talk of that and phrenology a little bit as yep. well. And he says that due to his state and due to his a certain, like, racial composition of himself, he is specifically susceptible more so 
than perhaps some of the Englishmen, the, the normal Englishmen, quotes, right. that Penclosa has been seeing up till now. Yeah, and certainly that kind of scientific racism was very popular at the time. Yeah, and Doyle doesn't dwell on it, but he mentions it. Right. If you're not paying attention, it's possible to miss that, but he does say that and describes him as black and Celtic. Mm-hmm. So, and at first I'm like, oh, does he just mean like, Irish souls are like black souls or something, but no, I I think he actually does, he is saying that Gilroy is a a mixed race person. Yeah, yeah. So that was kind of interesting. Yeah, so this was good. Definitely, I enjoyed it a lot. Like, it was a really quick read. I read it in, uh, I'm, I'm a slow reader, as I've mentioned before, but I read this story in like just a couple hours, and so it zoomed along really fast. So, I mean, I think that, again, is a testament to Doyle's writing style, mm-hmm. which he's not wrong in his description, and he's obviously proud of it, and I don't necessarily think that it's the only writing style to be venerated by any means, but it is a very concise and clear style that this story is not necessarily the best exemplar of, but it's certainly present, and right. I would say, yeah, again, like anybody who's sort of afraid to... to tackle 19th century writers would be very safe in his hands yeah absolutely. Uh, and the sherlock holmes stories one of the reasons they're so popular much to doyle's chagrin but you know <laughs> i mean i'm sure the reasoning one of the reasons that he would find sound is again yeah the writing is just so is so evocatively plain and simple in a good way that somebody in 2021 should really have no trouble just going oh okay that's cool you know right. it does read very well into the modern era yeah So the last work that we're covering tonight is another old friend that we visited once before, uh, Honoré de Balzac from France. Honoré de Balzac is considered one of the most prominent 19th century writers in France. He was born in 1799 in Tours, essentially the turn of the century. He had a lot of non-French influences as well, a lot of English influences from writers like Scott and Samuel Richardson, apparently. I haven't read Walter Scott, but I have read a little bit of Samuel Richardson a long time ago, so... Yeah. I've read a few Scott novels, and they're mostly like historical romances that I've read anyway. Yeah, he yeah, he wrote I mean, a lot, and he was certainly very for. popular. Yeah, and that's again something that Doyle was influenced by as well. So his name interestingly appears to suggest uh, royal lineage, but this was something that was made up yeah. by his father. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's kind of interesting. His real name was Balsa, or his original name. We're not going to go too much into the bio because we already discussed him a little bit, but much of his work is considered part of this Comédie aux Mains, which encompasses many, many novels and short stories. Uh, yeah. Do you know exactly how much? It's, it's, quite it's around 100 thing. works in total. Yes. It's a very large number of works. This one is, he, he kind of made these like unofficial groupings and categories of the various stories. So this one is one of two works in Scenes from Provincial Life, I think is the title there. The other one in that series being Eugenie Grandet, which I have not read, but he frequently paired similar themed works together. So Cousin Bet and Cousin Pawn, which are two of his more famous works, make up poor relations. Oh uh, no, you said you read Cousin and Pawn, right? And and Bat too. So Pawn has a very, very small connection with the novel we read tonight, in that one of the main characters from that is the music teacher who appears in this novel. And he's only just in the background. They don't really get into his character at all. They just mention he's the music teacher who would come down every now and then. But okay. like like Balzac connection. likes to do he makes him a main character in a totally different work. Yeah, that's interesting. That's something that I only really associate with modern writers, yeah. generally. He's certainly way ahead of his time as far as that goes. Yeah, like uh, creating a universe, yeah. as they say nowadays. Yeah. right, right. <laughs> yeah. So we read Ursula Miroe. Oh, I mentioned Cousin Paul earlier because, well, I mean, I asked about it after you mentioned it because 
it supposedly does deal with mesmerism a little bit as well. Yeah, in Robert Darton's book, Mesmerism and the End of the Enlightenment in France, he talks about one chapter in Pawn. And that chapter, I looked at my copy of it, again, because it's been a couple of years since I've read it, so it wasn't really fresh in my mind. But it doesn't right. necessarily deal with mesmerism per se, but it kind of talks about the dichotomy between the accepted sciences at the academic institutions versus these new experimental methods coming up. And the and this book does the same thing. Yeah. Most of the mesmerism stuff is all in one chapter. Right. And it is introduced in a similar way. Yeah. So I think that may be just the way Balzac approaches it. Yeah. Darton does call this one his main mesmerist novel. The themes of mesmerism and, I guess, spiritualism in the later half of the novel play more into the plot than in Cousin Pond, which is just kind of there for you. But this mm -hmm. does actually, while it's a very minor point, it's a very important point in how the novel yeah. unfolds. Yeah, for sure. We used the 1976 translation by Donald Adamson. I found it to be pretty good. I had some interesting thoughts about the story and, and how good the story was, but I have to say that it was immensely readable. Like, Oh, yeah. It was, yeah, it made me want to find out what happened next. And it was, it was a page turner, as they say. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I enjoyed it, but we'll get to, we'll get to specific feelings after the summary. But sure. so Balzac, Balzac is obviously having some fun with this. I don't know how this is in his other books, but this specific story takes place in the town of Nemours and Balzac takes great pains to tell us pretty early on that we will have a hard time with the yeah. characters of his book <laughs> and keeping them straight. Because they all have very similar names. Just a few families that have existed in this town for generations. And that have interbred to a, an extraordinary degree. And hyphenated French compound names are common. So you will regularly see members of these families who share names. For various hyphenated combinations of the names of the families. And so it's almost maddening how similar the names are in this book. Yeah. And the fact that he's doing it on purpose is both infuriating and kind of like <laughs> charming, I guess, in a way. This work is one of the better examples of how he can throw a lot of that at you. There was one of the other works by his that I've read, the Unwitting Mummers is the one translation I've seen in a couple other places, and the Firmum Ducigen where he does similar things, not necessarily with provincial names, but just throwing a lot of characters at you at once. And rather than referring to them by name, often refers to them by their occupation or their trade. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so he likes to play around with or identification. And he makes it difficult. He makes it difficult on purpose. And he almost says, like, I, it was funny because as I was reading, I'm like, Maybe a dramatis personae would help. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but then right after I was thinking that, he's like, yeah, don't bother, nothing would help. Like, mm -hmm. he, he essentially answered my query, and he's like, nah, just don't, Yeah, try not to worry about <laughs> right. it. So I didn't. I mean, it was a little bit maddening, but I did my best. So the summary might be a little bit difficult, but it's also not very long, because even though this was the longest work by far of the episode, um, there's not a whole lot to this story. It's more about how people feel about it and yeah. the events and their effects on the characters is way more important than the events themselves. Right, and Balzac is definitely a style and a mood, and that definitely comes across here. Yeah. So we begin with the story of the postmaster of Nemour, Minaret Levaux. And he is the postmaster of Nemour. He's this huge, dumb person. And we begin with a really nice caricature type description of yeah. him and how absurd this person is. Indeed, throughout the book, he is one of the most absurd of a very absurd cast of characters. He's really into his son, who is a law student. They, they kind of, he believes the world of him and that he can accomplish great things and so on. He's also one of the more well-off people in this town, being the postmaster and all, I suppose. And he seems to have various, he and his wife seem to have various interests like side interests perhaps yeah it seems like they have property and influence which would go away a long way in a provincial town like this yeah definitely and he and his cousin madame Massain, they're worried about their uncle dr Minoret, who seems to have turned into a religious fiend overnight possibly under the influence of 
his child, or not really his child, but his adopted child, Ursul. Dr. Minare has a lot of money, and the cousins are hoping to inherit. They're, in fact, very, very set on inheriting. There's a whole host of characters, the Minare and La Rose. They're, they're pretty well connected in the town. We get to meet the clerks and the tax collectors and the policemen and their wives. And there's there are three men, I think, who hope to benefit from the old uncle. And we have a bunch of stuff going into the family makeup of the town. Uh, there's not very wealthy aristocratic figures, low aristocrats, I guess you could say. They are, I guess, people whose fortunes fell somewhat during the French, during the revolutionary period. Yeah, that's um, another major theme that comes up in a lot of his works is the way that French society was turned upside down over and over again by the French Revolution and Napoleon, yeah. Napoleon being deposed, Napoleon coming back. And in this book, he doesn't seem very fond of the revolution. Yeah. That's my interpretation anyway, but you said it's more nuanced than that. Like there's more, goes into it a lot more in other books. But yeah. in yeah. this book, he seemed to come down sort of a little hard on it. But at the same time, and, and this is kind of interesting because everybody knows about the French Revolution. But I think the way it's sort of celebrated now, like in various sources, like for example, how, like how, for example, the French Revolution and the American Revolution are sort of not linked, but almost ideologically, there seemed to be a connection. Right. And I think that like, it's almost like, you know, when you watch the movie Gladiator or <laughs> you listen to the Rush song Bastille Day yeah, and right. you kind of forget that the Roman Republic didn't last like beyond that movie pretty much. Right. The, yeah. And even though like the song can celebrate the revolution and how important it was by the time this book takes place, there's sort of already a monarchy in place again. Yeah. And I think that a lot of people forget that. And I myself even had sort of, even though I knew about this and I knew about this, like, person calling himself Emperor Napoleon the mm Third -hmm. and all this stuff like having you know in the impressionist period of France in, in like eighteen thirty and all that stuff. I knew about all that. And then even even though I knew about all that, I still kind of thought, oh, you know, the revolution like undid the monarchy and all this stuff and like Tale of Two Cities and all that. And yeah. like it's not that simple. It's no, really it's not. not. And uh, I, I love Tale of Two Cities, but one of the, I guess, more poignant criticisms of it is that Dickens really should have called it a tale of one city, meaning the Parisian scenes really feel like Victorian London, not revolutionary Paris. And, you know, it's a fair criticism, but the chaos, not just from people being executed and the violence in the streets and all that, but of an entire, I guess, aristocratic society being overthrown and the decades that follow of them trying to regain whatever social status they had in society, oftentimes being quite unsuccessful and being reduced to poverty. It's a very long period of French history, certainly within one person's reasonable lifetime. I mean, Balzac himself was born in 1799 and died in 1850. So he's kind of living in between these events, you know, in between the revolution and the I guess, restoration of the monarchy in its various phases. Yeah, I mean, he certainly seems to have had, even though there are some lines that speak somewhat contemptuously, he seems to have had a, a certain amount of sympathy for the aristocracy expressed in this book, anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And in other words, he does take shots at the aristocracy. I think that's one of the cool things about this collective work, the human comedy, is I think he really tries to capture all aspects of humanity, not just imprinting his own views on the world and his characters. Yeah. So as well as the aristocrats, there are these four middle-class families, and they, although their lineages are very confused because they all intermarried and there's like all the hyphenated names, it's essentially described that the minorets run the tanneries, the levros are farmers, the messins are in trade, and the cremiers are millers. So these are, are all the pretty much all the important functions of the town right there. And Postmaster Minaret Lebro is Dr. Minaret's eldest brother's son. The doctor worked out of a town and it said 
at this point already that mesmerism seems to have been a thing of his. He's considering retirement, and so he starts asking about all his relations as he hasn't really kept up with them. Now, here is a weird thing that I found in the novel. He has this orphan child, Ursu Mirawe. He was also married to an Ursu Mirawe. Right. Again, I have this sort of weird suggestion of metempsychosis going on here because it just seems like even though he states several times that he would never marry the young Ursu, although the members of his family sort of expect that that's yeah, what right. he might try to do. Right. But he said he would never do it because it's not right. And they were like, that's kind of relieving to me that he doesn't want to. But at the same time, the child seems to mirror his wife. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like in very strange ways that yeah. are, I mean, it, it's like, I'm not saying it's uncomfortable, but it's just kind of weird. You know, yeah. As I didn't like, I, I didn't really understand. There were a lot of things about this book that I didn't quite I felt like I was missing something, like maybe it's just the character that Balzac was, or that the time, or the place, the fact that Ursul is, well, we'll get to her. Yeah. Okay, we'll get to her now, actually, but she's, uh, <laughs> she's an orphan that is, she's somewhat related. The doctor has some friends. He's friends with the priest, Chaperon, and he's also friends with this military captain, and... Uh, between the three of them, they are responsible for raising Ursul Mirawe. And the three of them are mothers, they're described as, more yeah, or less. Right. It's, it's kind of an interesting take. Yeah, at the time that the story's action starts, I mean, they go into a lot of backstory for quite a while, but uh, yeah. Ursul's 15 and the doctor's 83. Right, right. So he's quite on in years, and she's very devoted to him and her teachers. We spend some more time with the townspeople, and we learn that Zeli Livrose, the postmaster's wife, she's pretty domineering, and she pretty much has the she has the pants in that yep. relationship, yep. clearly. And she's not impressed by the whole Doctor Minoret going to church thing. She wants to see for herself. She wants to. There's a lot of discussion being generated in the town because Doctor Minoret was known as an atheist. Right. Dr. Minoret is pretty canny. He knows exactly what his relatives are up to from day one. Yeah. And he knows the reason for their obsequiousness. And he also knows that they hate his adopted Ursul. Yeah, they think she's trying to scam all of them out of their what they perceive to be their rightful inheritance money. Yeah. At this point, we also spend some time with this loathsome little guy called Gupil who's a law student, I believe, along with Minoret Lebro's son, Desiree. Yeah, he works as like a notary clerk. Yeah. <laughs> and we find out that Desiree is in love with this woman, and it's unrequited. And we go into, yes, so the background of Ursul is she is the daughter of Minoret's brother-in-law, who is a musician. When she's 10, the captain dies, so... By the time she's 15, when this story takes place, she only has the priest and her uncle. Ursul is a very religious person. She's very sad about the doctor not believing in God. Right. Or she, at least she had been up to this point. Now, what changed everything was magnetism and mesmer. And we have a lot of description of magnetism and physiognomy. Phrenology has gone into a bit how learned men in France, like the commission that we talked about earlier, yep. are against it. So Dr. Minaret falls out of friendship with several people as a result. He has this friend named Bouvard, who's actually really into it. And at the time, at least at this early stage, Minaret doesn't believe. So they have a falling out over this. And one day, though, Bouvard sends him a letter and he says, look, I'm, I'm not very well and things are coming ahead, but I want to tell you something and I want to show you this power of mesmerism that I know about. I think that you'll be impressed. So they go to see a specialist in a medium. The former is called a disciple of Swedenborg, not mesmer per se. Yeah, and they go a little bit into the split between the two of them. Right, yeah. And I didn't really read too deeply into that, but Swedenborg is somebody we've come across before actually already, and yeah. we may again yet, because he was definitely a known spiritualist. Absolutely. As well. Yeah. So 
the medium or the person who is like she's mesmerized and she's in a, a state where she can travel anywhere and see anything clairvoyantly. So Dr. Minerai says, oh, show me my house. And he's trying to be clever. You know, he's thinking like, oh, this will like, this, there's no way this will work in her favor. Right, right. And again, that's sort of like describing the Poe, uh, the, the woman speaking very slowly. It takes a really long time for things to come out. Sometimes like 20 minutes between sentences. So it's, it's a long time they're sitting there, I guess. But eventually, actually in quite short order, the doctor is quite enraptured because everything that she says is true. And uh, he also finds out things that he never knew about, like the fact that Ursul is apparently in love with a boy named Seven Yen, who she's never really met or spoken to, but he's seen has seen him pass by. This guy is the son of this Madame Portendouer, who is a one of the fallen aristocrats mentioned right. earlier. Yep. Everything the, the medium says is pretty much dead on. She's able to tell him where he keeps his money at home, in the paddock of Justinian, all sorts of other things that are obviously true. He's very startled by all this. He goes home and interrogates her soul about her. like Because one of the things that they did was they listened to her making her prayers, and the medium was able to say exactly what she said. So Ursul it gets interrogated and asked about what she said for her prayers, and she describes exactly what it was that they overheard. So at this point, the doctor has what is termed in the book a double conversion. So not only does he believe in mesmerism and the power of the medium, but he also believes in God. Right. I personally did not really understand the God part. So this ties more into what we'll be getting into next episode is a spiritualism angle, is yeah. that a lot of spiritualists use mesmerism as their way to contact the dead or... Yeah, and, uh, I mean, I do like, like as Poe like, po was we... saying in Mesmeric Revelation or something like that, is this is really explicitly linking the divine with mesmeric practices. Yeah, and I mean, I, I get the the first part of that. Like, I, the, obviously, the link with death has been something that's been emphasized for quite a bit and in almost all the stories yeah. that we've talked about. But right. I just don't, like, I don't see... I don't see how... I mean, Poe's conception of God seems quite different from Balzac's. Oh, yeah. And that's fine. Yeah. But I just don't see how how he made the leap from mesmerism to God. I just, I don't... Like, it doesn't seem like there was enough there, just the fact that he overheard her praying. Like, I don't know. It was good enough for him, so that's fine. <laughs> I just questioned that. Like, I wasn't I wasn't too fond of the religious conversion. <laughs> yeah, it, it worked for me. And, you know, I'm obviously not a religious person myself, but in the context of the story and Balzac's, I guess, view on not necessarily organized religion, but more personal piety and charity and things of that nature really come through in this as well as some of those other yeah. things. I do understand all that. And in the context of the story, I mean, it obviously is what needed to happen, but I don't know. I guess, I guess I'm just not in the right place to appreciate yeah, I, I how guess, those two things are linked. Yeah, right. I guess mesmerism and all that doesn't really get linked with traditional Catholicism or Christianity that much. But at the same time, I think around this time, new advancements were being made in physics, chemistry, sciences, and all that. And you have the teachings of Mesmer and his disciples. And I think there is a real intellectual need or intellectual desire to kind of reconcile the nature of God and spiritualism and all of that with the new emerging scientific disciplines of which on its surface animal magnetism and mesmerism appear to be a part of even though the royal commission in the late 1700s decades before the story was written basically yeah. said that mesmer was a fraud yeah all that all that makes perfect sense to me and and i'll go with it i'll go with it i just uh it, to me it's like one of those things where it's like oh, this weird thing must be true. So this other weird unrelated yeah. <laughs> thing must also be true. Like, I, I, I don't know. But yeah. uh, what well, you're saying is absolutely right, though. And I can see how that was important to to them. 
everyone almost at that time. And certainly for the doctor, it turns his entire worldview upside down. Like he's incredibly affected and moved by this. Yeah, very much so. And it changes his, I mean, it seems like he was always a nice person, like, you know, to yeah. begin with. And yeah. it, uh, I, I guess he starts to think about his future and his soul. Yeah. Right. And that's what it's because he knows he's not going to live that much longer. A bunch of the inheritors get together at Minare Labro's house with the notary Dioni, and they talk about how Ursula was an illegitimate child, and she therefore has no rights. Even her descendants, they don't have any rights either. They're obviously all a complete bunch of hypocrites. Yep. They yep. are... They're all very hateful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> and, and it is kind of funny. Like, I mean, it is the call of the comedy or man, right? So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, I think Balzac is certainly aware of this. And, but it is funny just how horrible they all are. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and Cousin Pawn is another example of that comedically grotesque, horrible characters. Yeah. And they're worried that he's going to marry her. For a minute, Desiree gets excited and he talks about, oh, maybe I could marry her. Maybe that would be cool. <laughs> His mom is, but like, she puts paid to that very quickly. She's like, I've got better plans for you, fool! Yeah, and right. That's pretty much how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> and so that gets quelled, like, in a matter of a second. But they might be hitting on something here, they think to themselves. Let's just say they start thinking about 7 yen and they start trying to hatch plans. There's also the magistrate, Bongrand, who's kind of a friend of the doctor. He's kind of more on the, the good side of things, I guess. He's relatively level-headed. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of funny because both him and especially the priest, like, they kind of walk around the town a lot, and, like, talking to people and yeah. hanging out with people. So, like, the priest, I mean, there were times when I'm like, yeah, this guy's depicted as a nice, good guy, but, like, you know, he's kind of... I don't know, like, he's kind of playing all sides here, like, right. I almost, ex like, obviously this isn't Balzac's character, but I was almost waiting for him to turn into a villain or something, <laughs> just because right. he was, like, always around and listening to everybody, yeah. so he knew everything, essentially. Bongrand, the magistrate, though, he's, like, going to the doctor, and he says, hey, you know your family are scheming, uh, maybe you should marry her, <laughs> and he refuses to do that, because he's not, not into that, he keeps saying that, which is good. Yeah, absolutely. They have a conversation that Ursula overhears, and she finds out that Seven Yan, this person that she's been staring at longingly without his knowledge, is in prison. He's gone to Dather's prison, and he's lived in Paris for quite some time, and he's lived very non frugally and kind of done a bit of a Poe, maybe, and made himself completely broke. Yeah, that's, that's another kind of character stock that Paul's acolytes is these young, ambitious, dashing nobles that gamble away their entire fortune and, and ruin themselves. Right. And of course, she denies being in love with him, which she probably doesn't even know herself because yeah. she's so... She's depicted throughout as being so innocent. Mm -hmm. You know, she just doesn't necessarily recognize the depths of her own emotions and is like, she's depicted as this person that mostly cares for God and is not aware of her own womanhood until she suddenly is. Yeah. And Minaret has a talk with her. He's sort of trying to prepare her for love, essentially. He's having the talk with her, but in the most non-sexual way possible. <laughs> Which is uh, something that I thought was interesting. This, like, I, I kind of do associate 19th century, even 18th century French works with a bit more sexual libertinism, uh, yeah. but this yeah. was very much the opposite. Yeah, uh, he, it's, the, it's the very doctor's a very, yeah, he's a very wholesome character, and he never has ambitions on Ursula at all. No, but uh, the whole book, like, is written in this kind of, like, yeah, I mean, obviously, everybody and their scheming is horrible and everything, yeah. but, like, Ursula is just so lofty, and so, and, and like, she's beyond, beyond a sexual object. Yeah, uh, she almost uh, otherworldly in that sense. Right, and even her relationship with Seven Yen is always depicted in a very chaste kind of way. Yeah, I think this is where the doctor talks about the relationship between love and the magnetic fluids. That Yeah, he does. Yeah, brings that into the equation, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. We spent some time with the Putin Weas for that. Uh, the mother is this kind of proud matriarch. She's an aristocrat. She's like 
scoffing at money all the time, but at the same time, she doesn't have any. So right. they're kind of like, they're really struggling. And it's almost like, I mean, I sympathize because it's like when you, money is this thing that you know you need, but you want to scoff at it and be like, oh, it's just wave it away, like hand wave it away and say it's just nonsense. Yeah. Right. But at the same time, like, maybe only somebody with the privilege of an aristocrat can sort of get away with saying that. Sure. And it's like, yeah, but she's not in the position that she might have wished herself to be in. So she, in fact, does need the money, even though she hand waves it away. And at this point, this Savignan, of course, he's not aware of Ursula at all. He's in love with this Comtesse who couldn't give less of a damn about yeah. her. Uh, <laughs> right. him. He's got a bunch of dandy friends that just egg him on. Yeah, and he writes her this like this this really sort of like expressive letter of all his feelings, and she just ends up sharing it with everybody in his like right. circle, including his mom. Yeah, <laughs> and she's like, uh, no. Unfortunately, there's some complexity to the situation because I think that his mother would kind of like it if he was tied to her. But at the same time, she herself, I think, is already spoken for. So she's like, can right. you please get this person off my Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it's kind of a funny situation. Definitely. Yeah, it's really embarrassing, like, all around. And amusingly, the priest, Chaperon, he almost makes a suggestion about Sevignan and Ursula. But the old Pertinguera lady, she's so harsh-sounding about Ursula that... He just doesn't, he doesn't bother. I think this is where we get the musical interlude and they're hanging out. They are actually have a gathering at Dr. Minorat's house, which is a rare event. Yeah. And this kind of reminded me of, of situations that I've sort of been slightly familiar with in my younger years. But yeah, when you like, I have people over who maybe have not so nice things to say about you or your family <laughs> and they're pretending to be nice and polite and kind and appreciative, but they're speaking behind your back and whispering and yeah, and like yeah. examining the whole thing and criticizing it. And I like I had like the first girlfriend I had in high school, her parents were like that. And so, you know, it was <laughs> it wasn't yeah, it wasn't good. And the funny thing was they would talk together in French, ironically enough, and assuming that nobody could understand them. And right. Certainly my father and stepmother could not understand what they were saying, but it wasn't always nice things. So sure. <laughs> it is kind of a familiar situation, very lifelike. So I, I don't know. I appreciated that. We have other gatherings, like a very awkward dinner at Madame Portenduera's place, where the notary clerk, who's uh, Goupil, that loathsome person mentioned earlier, kind of shows up and makes things worse. It's kind of an odd character because, like, he makes everybody feel uncomfortable. I forgot what it was about him, but he's described as this, like, physically undesirable specimen with a hunchback. Yeah. So he's pretty much your, like, unlikable disabled villain character, kind of. Yeah, he's very much a schemer and pretty much nasty to everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And, yeah, so I think it's that uh, what they're trying to do is they're trying to get Seven Yen out of prison and... Ursul kind of speaks on his behalf, and there's some complicated circumstance involved there, but essentially the doctor agrees to help him, and there's some like kind of Romeo and Juliet type stuff going on between right. Seven Yen and Ursul at this point already, and Balzac is aware of this. He kind of comments on it slyly and humorously. He says, like, he acknowledges that it's a cliche, and he says there should be a window tax because he talk, talks about all the, the lovers that communicate in this kind of fashion. And if there was a tax on it, I guess the government would be very rich or something like that. It's cute and funny. They start writing letters back and forth. And it's at this point, like, uh, Seven Yam really wants to turn his life around. He obviously doesn't enjoy being in prison and he doesn't know that he screwed up in his school days and dishonored his, his family to an extent and stuff. He's proposes to take more classes and maybe join the Navy. And love is a great motivator, usually. So 
he manages to completely earn Minaret's approval, surprisingly. He says, though, that they should keep things a secret if they can, because... They're not being very discreet and everybody's watching right. them. And even though he warns them, uh, they don't. Like, they, it's, yeah. it's, it's not secret at all. Sevian goes off to Algeria to fight some Africans, and uh, Ursul pines hard during this time, and she has some premonitory dreams, but she throws herself into studies and reading and religion. Dr. Minaret takes her on a trip to the seaside where they see the fleet depart for Africa, and then they spend some time in Italy. And this is pretty much the last of the happy times Ursula spends with her beloved uncle. Mm -hmm. Because in 1830, things go rather well for the doctor's enemies, and then they all get positions of prestige and power. Minaret starts investing his money, and he builds an addition to the house and acquires horses and a coach, which causes the family to complain about the money that should be theirs being spent on this old man's folly. Right. And they, of course, they blame Ursul for pretty much everything. In 1832, on Ursul's 17th birthday, Yen shows up, and he's a sub-lieutenant now, and he's decorated and seems to res basically... Resign his commission, he's ready to, he's had his military career, I guess, already, and he's a changed man, and hangs out with Rasul and the doctor, and of course this is all commented on bitterly by the annoyed relatives. Yes. The person that seems the most hateful and strident is Minare Levro's wife, Zeli. She doesn't seem that badly off herself, like, she seems like they're doing okay. It just seems to be more motivation by greed and pettiness. Yeah, I mean, there is some real, I don't know, like, there's real folly in these characters because, I yeah. mean, the, like, these people do not seem, they don't seem like they're, like, they don't seem like they really need any of this. And right. it seems like by the time that they're all done squabbling, and if, like, let's say, if the inheritance is divided up, like, reasonably evenly, each of them will only get a relatively small portion there. Sure. Yeah, it wouldn't be a game changer or anything like that. It would just be an extra cushion, I guess. Yeah. And in a bizarre twist, Goupil, the clerk, says that he'll make sure that they don't get married, or at least he'll break it up. Yeah. And he kind of tries to make a deal with the notary, and he's like, maybe I can buy your practice off you or something. And he expects monetary compensation from the family, I guess. Just a few days after his 89th birthday, Dr. Mirare becomes deathly ill and he's pretty much on the point of death at this point and everybody knows this they learn it rather quickly in this small town so all the heirs are gathered around like vultures yeah. and it isn't long before they start loudly fighting pretty much right in the earshot yeah. of <laughs> the sick man the doctor moments before his death he tells Ursula to retrieve a letter he's hidden follow the instructions there and to marry seven yen and so forth, pretty much immediately. But unfortunately, Minaret Lavreau, the huge, hulking, dumb postmaster who turns out to be rather stealthy, has been hanging around listening just in case. So he overhears and he runs to grab these papers before Ursula can get to them. And even though Minaret asks her to show them to him, she does not. And when she returns to the room, obviously she's in a pretty bad state. Like, she's kind of distraught and kind of hysterical, so to speak. And she doesn't have the papers. She hasn't even discovered they've been stolen at this point. She just doesn't have them because she's, like, sort of preoccupied with him. And, like, he wants to see them in her hands before he dies. So the fact that he doesn't means that he dies with this horrible cry and, like, expression on his face. And that is how she last remembers him because now he's no more. The packet the postmaster takes contains not only a letter for Usul, but the last will and testament. Putting Seven Yen pretty much in charge, in co-executor, I suppose would be the right term, of the estate along yeah. with Usul. Right. One of the last things they had happen was they tried to emancipate Usul, which means, I suppose, that she was no longer necessarily somebody who needed to be to have a guardianship. And it seems that it was only partially effective 
because even though those papers seemed to be signed and everything, it still seemed like she was kind of, I mean, I guess it was just because she was a, a woman rather than because of her specific position. But it just seemed like she was very beholden to everybody else and what they decided to do with her kind of thing. Yeah. She doesn't have a lot of agency in this book, and that's unfortunate. Like, at the very end, she kind of does, but she spends the whole thing just kind of reacting to everything that happens around her. Yeah, absolutely. Minaret Lebro goes to burn the papers, and he gets a bad sign when the first two matches that he lights don't ignite, and Balzac says this is a sign from God, and it's a warning. So, already we have some foreshadowing that things aren't going to go well, so... At some point, we're going to get to enjoy Mirare and Lebro getting his just desserts. Uh, we pretty much know this already. So there's lots of talk of the money. The will mentions the 36,000 francs hiding in the doctor's books, which were formerly alluded to by the medium in a previous chapter. The postmaster rushes back to the uncle's house to grab it all without the family knowing. And he does this. Nobody realizes what he's done. They all kick Irsul out of the house. She wants to go anyway. She's very distraught. And that's, they, they kind of think they're rid of her at this point. They open the house to be gone through by the heirs. Goupil sort of sides with the Massens and the Menorets, that is the new Menorets, call on their debt owed by the Portin wares because they got seven yen out of prison, or that is the doctor did. And so now that these people have taken over all his obligations, they're like, where's our money? And everyone's suspicious of one another already. Yep. And the new minarets, they have all these ideas. It's also becoming paranoid. So Ursul, well, I mean, she, I guess she buys it. Well, Bogran does it on her behalf. A small house. And she moves into this house and everyone tries to make it very, well, everyone being her friends, try to make it very nice for her and exactly like her previous abode as much as possible. But it's clear that it's much diminished circumstances for her. She has the old servant, La Bougival, who used to be Dr. Minaret's servant and is now staying with her and devoted to her care. She gets a bunch of furniture and books and so on, but not before all the books are gone over like in a very rapacious manner by the family and put up an auction and it's a kind of a funny description of how the auction goes because everyone is like pawing through the books trying to see yeah. if there's any <laughs> hidden compartments or like stuff stuck between the pages or something like that and somebody i think Bonkron has hired this like collector to sort of act as a go-between and buy the books back for her because she's a very studious person and she likes the library and she wants to be able to keep it. Now, Minoret you know, Lebro has a problem. He can't stand being in close proximity to Ursul. He doesn't want her to be around, even though she's not causing any trouble and she seems to be sort of settling down into what's described as a kind of harmonic melancholy, where it's not, it's sad and it's obviously not happy, but it's like she, she can manage and she can live. So... I think our thoughts of Ursula committing suicide at this point are, it's not that strong. She's probably still hoping that she can, probably not hoping she can get with Sevignan at this point, because it seems like his mother doesn't want this, and she can't marry till she's as of a certain age, because Minaret made her promise, and she wants to uphold his promise, even though technically she's certainly old enough to get married at this point. Right. She also doesn't want to bring Seven Yen down with her. Right, right. And there's all this feeling of, like, nobody's adequate to one another. Like, there's he's from an aristocratic family that's fallen from favor, and she's lost whatever fortune she's apparently supposed to have, which her friends still think that belongs to her, that should be around somewhere. But she doesn't really seem to be thinking about it all that much because she's such a pure person i guess yeah, right that, that these ideas of capital and stuff don't concern her that much but minaret lebro begins a campaign of persecution against her soul in earnest he tries to get group hill to marry her and at this point he's like you know you can start a law practice out of town and move to this place far away and i'll never have to think about any of you ever again Goupil's like he, he kind of scoffs at this and he's like i don't really want to marry her but i'll pretend and the two men sort of go along with this. Now, Goupil really, really hates Minoret Lebro, 
And it's not really... I didn't quite get why. I think it has something to do with their son, but I don't yeah, really... Yeah, he snubbed really... him a couple times, and he was also snubbed by the father as well. Yeah, I guess so. I just, I guess he holds a grudge. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Like, he's that kind of person who never yeah. forgets. And yep. Mind you, Minaret Lebro does seem to be a real dickish piece of work. Sure. But his son seems relatively innocent. Yeah. It's so kind of I don't really know what he's supposed to have done to him. Yeah. There's this whole nasty, scandalous thing going on where Gopal starts, like, trying to undermine Ursula's character by openly parading his supposed love for her in the streets, but at the same time kind of making her look like a tramp, I guess. Mm -hmm. Because everybody knows that, like, she's supposed to be waiting for seven yen and all this stuff, I guess. So, like, he has things like, has, like, marching bands pass by her home and stuff like that. And <laughs> it's very, like, parodic and kind of, oh, uh, again, grotesque. Yeah, It's right. very grotesque. Right. Oddly now, like, later on, Minaret Lebro, like, because Ursula doesn't seem, she still doesn't seem very inclined to leave. So there's this all this business with uh, Minaret Lebro buying a mansion and stuff. Ursula's really upset because she thinks that after all the stuff parading in the streets and all the, the things that were said about her, which are like nasty hints and stuff, the town doesn't think she's a virgin anymore, which is very upsetting. And it's like, it's it's uh, the height of badness. So, oddly, Madame de Portenuer, who kind of spurned Ursula completely before, has sort of come around by this point, and they're kind of friends. And she says, no, that's not true. Seven Yen tries to encourage her as well. Seven Yen has a private conversation with Gupil, I think, and it almost turns into a fist fight. Surprisingly, all of Ursula's man friends, like, they already know who the instrument is. They already know exactly what's happening. They know Gupil's been doing this all along, and that he's, like, the instrument of somebody. Although, I don't think at this point they quite realize that it's the postmaster. But right. they're getting there. So yeah. Minaret Lebro kind of starts feeling good about himself now. He's caught unawares when Seven Yen shows up. And again, he's ready for a fight. He asks for an explanation. And Zeli, his wife, immediately cuts in. And she's all blusteringly goading her husband into a duel with the person who's insulted him. So she, like, wants there to be a duel between these two. I don't really know. Like, she's, she's just... Wow, uh, what a what a oh, what a piece of work! So yeah. Minaret Lebeau's kind of a pathetic figure, and his manhood fails him. And then so <laughs> Seven Yen is actually demanding that Desiree, their son, conduct the duel because he's like, "Oh, you're old and you're not that strong anymore." So right, I demand satisfaction, but I demand satisfaction from somebody who is my equal, right. which is not you. And I think actually that's the main reason Zeli is like pushing for this yeah absolutely yeah she doesn't want anything bad to happen to her son she like dissuaded him from all these things that she thinks are like the wrong paths for him in life mm -hmm. so and it's at this point that Gupil, because he's a duplicitous person he decides to turn traitor against minaret lebro i think he kind of gets persuaded or not really persuaded but he's kind of like talked to Gupil's like oh i never really liked that minaret lebro he's an asshole and I will now I'll turn my attentions to besmirch him. And I think at this point, the good people of Nemor are starting to suspect that Minaret Lebro has stolen some important things from the from the family. Right. From Ursula specifically, but only her friends like go that far. The rest of them are like, oh, he's stolen from us. And Gupil starts plastering up some Minaret is a thief graffiti all over the walls and stuff. And... <laughs> Minaret Lebro sees all this and he's kind of like he, he's very conspicuous because like people try to talk to him about it and stuff and he instead of like acting like this is oh this is all bullshit and stuff like he's kind of a combination of blustery and unconfident and so he makes himself look really really bad at this point. Kupil is set up in his new practice and he writes a letter to Seven Yen recanting his confession and threatening physical violence <laughs> then all of a sudden two unknown assailants show up in the street and they beat the shit out of Gupil yeah. and disappear into the darkness right so things are getting pretty fraught at this point Ursula starts getting spectral visitations from her old dead guardian who reveals that with great specificity the minaret 
liberal theft. It shows exactly what happened in great detail, pretty much to the letter, as described in an earlier chapter. So Minaret Lebro and his wife, now they've been fighting for days because that whole incident with the, the prospective duel and stuff set them at odds big time. They were already kind of at odds because Zaylee suspected her husband of something because he didn't, he decided not to tell her about what he'd stolen. One day he pretty much beats her into complete immobility. It's really bad. Minare tries to bribe Ursul into leaving the town with a 12,000 franc a year income. And when pressed by everyone, he keeps making up this story about his son being in love with Ursul, which is complete and utter nonsense. Right. Des Desiree couldn't care less about her, honestly. Now this a special visitor shows up to threaten the life of Desiree, and he writes a letter to them, and he's like, yeah, well, this guy wants a seven yen, wants a duel with me, and this is a, you put me in a really bad position, <laughs> essentially. It's a really candid letter, and I kind of, I, at this point, wished, because I, I realized, like, things are almost over, and I'm like, well, I kind of wish we'd spent a little more time with this guy, because he seemed like he might have been all right, but he wasn't really that much of a, a part of the story till the end, so. Right. And then, to everyone in the town's astonishment, this huge, hulking Minaret Lebro starts losing weight. He starts, like, looking really bad. Definitely, something's not right in that camp. I guess duels are technically illegal at this point. Yeah. They would become, they kind of go back and forth for a while there. Certainly, a, a pretty well known facet of early 1800s French culture, right? Gets depicted a lot in, in various things. I just watched the movie The Duelist for the first time uh, oh, yeah. a, few, a few weeks ago. That was pretty cool. Yeah, even though, I mean, I think that some of the acting choices might have been weird. But, yeah, whatever. It was a good movie. And, and it definitely depicted that dueling kind of cultural thing. And it's something that Poe wrote about a lot. Too. Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, you also see it in Russia. You see it in America. You see it in a lot of places. Right, right. Sims. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So after they get the letter from Desiree, Minaret Lebro finally confesses to his wife. And she's not actually very disapproving, but she insists that she has to take charge of the situation. So she makes this last-ditch effort to try to convince Ursul to marry her son. But this is finally when Ursul stands up for herself, and she makes a very good case as to why this is a really bad idea. Like, it's not just, oh, woe is me. It's actually a very intelligent, well-argued thing. Yeah, and right. I'm like, why couldn't she be like this through the whole book? Because yeah. finally she's doing, she's like actually having some agency. But Zaylee is like, I don't know. She seems, she seems a bit moved by this. Like, she's like, yeah, I guess it kind of makes sense. She talks to the priest a bit though. And she comes to the conclusion that the dreams are fake. In fact, there's more to it than that. And this is Zaylee. She's like, there's something going on here. And of course she suspects the worst. But Balzac kind of says that at this point, the couple, the Minaret and La Rose, are starting to feel remorse, even though they won't admit it. And Ursul's friends, they try to figure out how to get them to really admit it and tell what's up. It turned out that Dr. Minaret scrawled some numbers into the margins of his books. And there are script numbers for bonds and such. And Bonkram shows up at the law office to get the ledger. And it contains a record of the scripts. And Gupil at this point is sort of a changed man as well. And he appears, he's married, and he seems good natured. And Bongran at this point arranges to have Zeli arrested and makes Zeli confess at his office. And uh, that forces Minaret Lebro's hand. Meanwhile, their son is suddenly run over by a carriage in a terrible accident. And he loses both his legs and dies shortly afterwards rather pointlessly. And after all the madness, Minaret Lebro begs Ursul's forgiveness. And this drives Zaylee mad. And she also dies shortly afterwards. Not before seeing the apparition of the old doctor. Yeah, 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 that's right. Seven Yen and Ursul marry, and they get the Chateau Rouvre house, and lots of money, 24,000 francs a year from Minaret, and he has become the kindliest and most pious man in Namor. Gupil does all right, but he's blessed with this, uh, this like his deformities and hydrocephalus children. Yeah. 
So, and that's pretty much the end of the story. Yeah, everything works out well for Usul and Seven Yen, which I wasn't expecting at the end here, but I think overall the story worked really well. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely so. And I, again, I thought this was very readable. The, the story elements were a bit mundane, but again, it was more about the feelings of the people involved, yeah, I think, right. and how they resonated emotionally. And Balzac did do that well, even if I found the characters that you're supposed to root for hard to identify with uh, yeah. personally. Yeah, right. Like, right. I just thought Ursula was too, it was a bit too much, a bit too much of this, like, the angelic female yeah, like it was okay. Sure, it was the opposite of the Doyle, <laughs> you know, yeah, in a way. Yeah, yeah. But it was like, either way, either is a, a little bit too much. You yeah, know, right. it's like, this is not a real person. This is like some kind of archetype of purity. Right. And it kind of reminds me of Little Nell from Dickens or some character like that, you know. Yeah, and I haven't read, so I read a fair bit of Dickens, but I think you've read more Dickens than I have. And you definitely picked up on Dickens' resonances. I did too especially towards the end. Yeah, there's definitely some precursors to A Christmas Carol here with the apparitions saying, you know, do this or else. And the big inheritance fight Dickens also had as one of his plot constructs in the novel Martin Chuzzlewit. Okay, yeah, I haven't read that one. Yeah, that, that one's pretty good, but it's not what I would put in like his top five or six or whatever. But it's the same kind of thing where you have an old person who's accumulated all this wealth and he sees all of his family around him just scheming for his inheritance you know they don't care about him at all they just care about his money yeah yeah there were interesting interesting depictions of the town balzac describes it as being kind of like a nation unto its own right i guess with all the different people right and their yeah. function, yeah functions and stuff he also kind of describes it as a beehive mm -hmm. it's very very cool like kind of i mean we'll be doing a lot of science fiction later that's that's more social in nature it's kind of like Maybe it takes place on a different planet, but that the idea is more to examine the societies and so on. So you get a lot of like interesting looks at society and so on. And I will say that probably out of everything that we've done so far and I've added much that we will do in the future, this book is, is definitely like if you're looking for a science fiction story, this is not it. It's very tangential, the elements of mesmerism right. and spiritualism at the end, which yeah. itself but is pretty tangential to science fiction, but it does have a very important place in how the genre will develop and form and its tropes later on. Yeah, but if you're looking for a good, a well-written story, you might want to look into this. Yeah. And that's like, again, when we start some of these things, we don't know how connected they may be to our themes, but ultimately what's important, I think, is how good the story is, more so exactly. than, yeah. you know, what's covered. And right. Balzac does seem like he was somebody who, yeah, he was he was actually, that French Enlightenment book you mentioned does talk about how serious he actually took this subject. Yes, yes. And this was something that he actually did believe in. Yeah, very Phrenology much so. is also something that comes into this book, mm -hmm. and that was an accepted science of the time. Yes. There's various kind of funny things that are described, like, for example, he says that forehead that recedes into the crown indicates materialism. <laughs> right. So... Yeah, like, that's that's a thing. Yeah. Balzac really loves that. <laughs> but yeah, he might have some of that women or angels thing going on, like, in their ideal form. And you see, yeah, you see some of that in 19th century fiction from Britain, but I guess I just associated, like, the French decadent style with being sort of a little further away from that. Mm -hmm. So Balzac was a bit of a surprise to me in that he's not like that at all. It's very chaste and very pious. Right. Not not in an extremely annoying way, although I did make a point of the conversion earlier and how it didn't really make sense to me. But everything leading up from that point, it described, I mean, somebody described Balzac, I guess he might have said something like this, but that Catholicism is essentially a perfect system to keep humans from being depraved creatures. Right. So <laughs> it's almost, I mean, it's not materialistic, but it's almost a philosophical way of looking at Christianity beyond the the whole like supernatural godliness aspect of it and as a powerful being and all that but the fact that it is Catholicism especially a system designed to keep us on the right path yep. and it seems like that was important to Balzac absolutely he had a very high respect for charity and these personal doing good you know being kind to your neighbors and your family and your relations 
he really depicts the people that aren't like that in a very vivid, almost caricaturish way. Yeah. Yeah, I thought Minaret quizzing Ursul about her prayers, like yeah. <laughs> after he comes back to Mesmerist, it, it was really comical. Yeah. I'm not sure if it was intended to be so. I think maybe it was, but it's like, how are you so powerful? Yeah. Did you make a pact with the Archfiend? Right, right. <laughs> and, and <it's>, yeah. <laughs> so what do you think of the villains in this book? They're very Balzacian villains in that they're selfish schemers out to... I guess there's not really a lot of love triangle, marriage ruining, adultery stuff here. It's more inheritance scheming and trying to get money and social position. But these are pretty common tropes that you'll see in a lot of his works. For me, reading this on top of some of his other stuff, it pretty much felt very familiar and at home. I'm not sure if this is entirely complimentary, but have you ever seen the movie 101 Dalmatians? The Disney? Yes. Yeah. Or read the, read the book. I read the book actually... Uh... Uh, I'm assuming the book came first, but I can't remember who wrote it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't read the book. Yeah, I don't think it was an adaptation because it was quite long and most, I don't know. But hmm. anyway, I did watch the movie too, the old one, not the yeah, yeah, right, yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, right. So, you know, there's this villain, Cruella DeVille. Right. <laughs> and her purpose is that she wants to, like, kill all the dogs and use their coats, like, use their fur for a fur sure. coat that yeah. she can wear. The villains in the book, especially Zaylee, reminded me of Cruella DeVille. You know, it was just like, no matter what was presented to her, and no matter, like, how many alternatives there were, it was like, no, I must have these dogs! Yeah, right. And, like, you know, it was just so stubborn and pointless. Yeah. You know, it's like, like I was saying, I mean, surely if everything was really divided up properly, like, each person would only get a small portion of money anyway. Yeah. So, like, this whole thing is, is really pointless. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's not necessarily that they're going to gain a lot of money. It's that Ursul doesn't get any. Yeah. And I, I think yeah. they're really concerned more about that factor, that who they perceive as like this illegitimate piece of trash is encroaching on their territory, no matter how small or insignificant that would be. Right. They want to make sure she doesn't get anything. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's more important. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's just, I don't know, it's a really sad set of circumstances. Yeah. Like, there's nobody nobody really stands to benefit that much. I mean, Ursula can. Like, she could take advantage of this and live, I guess, in positive circumstances. Mm -hmm. I don't know what Sabine, Sabine Yan is supposed to be doing, like, after they're married and stuff. Like, um, I mean, Presumably has some kind of military pension. And... Well, I guess so, yeah. But is he just, you know, is he just going to be, like, a house husband from here on forward? I, I guess know. doing whatever <laughs> French nobility do. You know, hang out and <laughs> be royal yeah. and all that, you know. Yeah, I guess so. So, Balzac is kind of like the less pithy, but like, I don't know, it kind of reminded me of, of Bulwer Lytton in yeah. how full he was of little quotes and aphorisms. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Like, things that don't, some of them are pretty good, but some of them are, uh, I, I wrote a bunch of them down here, because some of them are, <laughs> are, like, funny and good, and they're all really short, so. Girls who go wild with their bodies are sometimes wise with their heads. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Antipathies stem from the collision of personalities, not from the clash of ideas. Uh, see another one. Charity stores up in heaven what miserliness accumulates on earth. Right, right. There's like thousands of them. Yeah. All throughout this. Like, he just seems to be really fond of them. There's other ones that are very pro-French. Yeah, what else? Oh, there's some stuff about religion. The deist is an atheist with reservations. <laughs> right. <laughs> Unbelievers dislike music, that heavenly language developed by Catholicism. Believers and non-believers speak two different languages and cannot understand each other. Thanks to its clear language, France acts as a kind of trumpet to the world. The French are too habitually distracted to hate each other for long. The more beautiful music is, the less it is appreciated by ignorant people and so on. There's lots of this. <laughs> and and he just is fond of these like little one sentence quips yeah. that try to summarize some kind of social like social framework or fabric, I guess. His narration yeah. is pretty much a separate character in itself. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. He says uh, there's lots of funny turns of phrase, uh, some of which I don't quite understand. A funny one I thought was the mesmerist, I think, he was stroking his chin in a manner common to stage servants, mathematicians, and priests. 
<laughs> that's, a, that's a funny thing. A solution for a down on his luck wastrel in 19th century France. Marry a rich lady. <laughs> right. <laughs> if she's pretty, well, so much the better. That's uh, something that Sevignan's friends kind of expressed to him. Right. There's, there's something that I didn't, on, yeah. there's, I mean, yeah, there's like a few things I didn't really go into. Like while he's in prison, he gets visited by some of his friends. One of whom I think you said was in another book. It's several, actually. Yeah. Ross okay, yeah. is one of the Balzac characters that appear the most in this. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, they that didn't really play into it that much. So that's why I didn't mention it. Cause yeah. Like, the summary was already sort of long, but there was a bunch of other characters that got introduced briefly that didn't really have too much to do with it. Yeah, like, living in this kind of town environment seems pretty hellish. <laughs> Absolutely. But, yeah. <laughs> and these these heirs, they keep visiting and keep, like, trying to undermine each other and stab each other in the back. It's kind of funny, because, like, just after I finished the book a couple of weeks ago, my friend and I watched the movie that came out recently, Knives Out. Mm. Which is uh, like this kind of comedy mystery story, Who Done It? Well, not really Who Done It. It's kind of like it. Rem it did remind me a lot of Agatha Christie, though, and it reminded me of like this story. And then it was a bunch of scheming people who were supposed to inherit. And at the beginning, like it was the guy's birthday, and he was still alive. And I think it was one of Christopher Plummer's, possibly his last role, actually. Yeah. And Daniel Craig is in it too, who plays the new James Bond. Right. Right. But, but he's like doing this incredibly like ridiculous but consciously so southern u.s accent throughout <laughs> yeah as like he's he's the detective so at the end of the movie he gets to kind of like explain to everybody what happened and yeah it was very it was actually quite entertaining i thought <laughs> but it reminded me a lot of this story so it's one of these things that coincidentally like happens you're like oh i just read a booklet that has a similar theme but it was kind of funny because all throughout this book, I thought there was going to be a murder. Like, I thought, oh, yeah. surely somebody's <laughs> going to get killed at some point. Yeah, yeah. And I guess somebody technically does, but uh, not yeah. in a murder way, more of a, an accident. Yeah. I thought the son's death was very unfair. Yeah, but in a way, it was kind of divinely ordained. It, it's not like he had any wrongdoing or part in it, but, you know, punishing oh, the I, son for the yeah. father's crimes and all yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, I, that, I don't know. I don't... I mean, I mean, again, like I see, I have to adopt a certain amount of detachment reading some of these stories. Yeah. But like, you know, I'm like, I don't see that that's justice. I don't see that that's like oh, no, in no, any no. way yeah. fair. Yeah. And and I don't see why Ursula should get all the good things, and this guy who didn't really have anything to do with anything, <laughs> right. just like gets run over by a fucking horse carriage yeah. and dies miserably just because his father is a dick. Yeah. Like I don't know. <laughs> right. I, I didn't like that. <laughs> uh again like i'm not taking down balzac for it but i just like since the story is so big on justice and on the goodness of things i didn't think that was yeah the, the, the least villainous character is probably the one that has the yeah i mean zaylee zaylee is depicted in the story as being such a like yeah in a way, she's a victim, too, because her husband, when he gets upset and can't stand the way things are going, he just beats the crap out of her, yeah. right? But but she's also she's so, like, unreasonable, right? Like, she's kind of the closest to that Cruella de Vil kind of character that just doesn't see reason at all. And you could tell her, well, you can get a fur coat some other way. Like, you can, <laughs> right, yeah, you know, and yeah. it's just like, no, it has to be these dogs! Yeah. And, you know, it's just, oh, <laughs> get out of my face yeah right. <laughs> it's really weird because i mean i can i can say a lot of things that i didn't like about this book but i enjoyed reading it oh i did too yeah <laughs> I, I thought that's really good <laughs> i mean i don't know i i again like i don't know how much of it is just my distance from the source material i guess and from there's some cases where you do have to say well this book was written a long time ago by somebody in a very different mental state than anybody around today. So it's kind of hard to relate to, but you can at least try and you can sort of see the emotion in it. And mm -hmm. I did. And like the book was just written so charmingly in a way and so engagingly, like right from the first with that caricature of Minoret and Lebrou, that at no point did I not want to keep reading. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, yeah. It really draws you in. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's Balzac. I don't think we'll be coming back to him. No, I don't but... believe so either. But I certainly enjoyed 
reading another work of his that I have not read before. And yeah. I'm glad I could sink that one in. And this is a, a learning experience for us. So we, we find things that we might want to come back to as individuals later. And I know there's so much to read now and everything, not just for the podcast, but there's a lot of in other general, things that we yeah. want to read. But I mean, Goriti is on my radar now. I yep, would absolutely. I would read, especially her first, like supposedly very gothic novel. Yeah. Sounds like something I would read. And, and Belzac has a lot of stuff. And a lot. I feel like I would enjoy reading anything, even if I find certain aspects like a little bit, eh, you know, disconcerting. Sure, yeah. And even I mentioned having read Ursul, and I had posted about it online, and somebody said something like, oh, if you want better female characters, read this Balzac. Uh, yeah, right, exactly. I can't remember which one it was, but I'm like, okay, okay, cool. I, I probably will. I mean, there's over 100 works in the comedy there's a lot. Man, yeah, so. there really is a lot. So, good. And I don't know if there's much else to be said about it. You know, emotionally, it was powerful and it was funny in mostly all the right places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. A few things I wasn't sure if it was intended to be that way or not. But either way, it still kind of worked. So yeah, I'm not really complaining. I would recommend this if you just want a good, well-written story that is it's a bit like a modern, it's a bit like a soap opera kind of <laughs> yeah. in a way. But and on paper, if you told me about the book... I might sort of turn my nose up at it, but just by the style and by the, the fact that Balzac works really hard to engage his audience, I actually don't think it's a problem. So recommended. Yep, I agree. So with that, I believe that brings us to the end of our fiction for tonight, episode 11 of Chrononauts. I think so. But we will not be entirely leaving behind all the themes of this episode. Next time, we will be discussing spiritualism, which is a natural, wider, you might say, perception of some of the themes that mesmerism attempts to take into account. Yeah, they certainly go hand in hand. Yeah, absolutely. And although, it's, as it's described, mesmerism might just be a small gateway into the spiritual right. world. Right, exactly. And so, in a way, we will be expanding ourselves for the next episode so if you can why not tell us about the material that's coming up next sure time. so we are going to be doing some more works from argentina in particular the novel the marvelous voyage of senor knickknack by eduardo ladislo holmberg which i have translated and is now up for you to read on our blog spot at chrononautspodcast.blogspot.com likewise i also did two translations of two Leopoldo Lugona short stories, which we're going to be reading next time. The Psycon and An Inexplicable Phenomenon. In addition to those two short stories on the blog spot, I also posted a translation of another Lugona short story, as well as two other Latin American authors from this time period, one from Argentina and one from Mexico, which we won't be covering next time, but we'll be covering in a future episode down the line. But for now, if you're interested in the stories, you can read them on the blog spot. And in addition to these works, we're going to be covering Marie Corelli's A Romance of Two Worlds. So it should be an interesting collection of works. I'm certainly excited for the Lugonis and the Holmberg, as I've read those already. So I know what to expect going in there. And I think they'll offer some pretty yeah. weird stuff. I haven't had a chance to look at that yet. So yeah. I'll be doing that probably pretty early on in the next few weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Those stories are very short. So... Again, like the Poe and the Garidis we covered this time, if you want something that takes 15 or so minutes to read, there they are. Yeah. Uh, the longest work is the Corelli, I assume. Yep. Yep. That's, again, like the Balzac from this one, longer than everything else combined. But uh, we'll get through it. It's not an unreasonably long work, and it certainly looks like it's going to cover lots of interesting philosophies, especially the religiosity angle. All right. Sounds excellent. Well, we hope that your magnetic fields are properly aligned. And remember that the magnetic lady can fix most of your ills should you turn to her. That is all for tonight, folks. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We certainly had a fun time doing the research and talking about all the stories and this very strange concept of mesmerism. Good night. Good night. We hope to see you next time.